for Van and Dolan. Uh, yes, uh, on the, the matter with the, uh, th there was an appeal of the rezoning on Erie Road for the f medical building. I declared a conflict of that last December. My wife's on the uh, Harrow Health Team Board. Thank you, Councillor. We'll make note of that. I need the adoption of published agenda, please. A mover. Uh, Deputy Mayor Malash and Councillor Verbeek. And uh, Rob, you wanted to add something? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, just a couple of amendments on the agenda. Um, on bylaw 1790, the Schedule A map depict, depicting the Harrow um, authorized truck routes uh, should show uh, from Sinisac East, on Sinisac East from Queen to the Easterly Limit as being the authorized truck route. Uh, and then secondly, by law 1799, uh, section 5.1, subsection J, the numeric reference uh, in that section should be to 20 cubic meters, not two. And that's it. Thank you, Rob. Uh, I need a motion. Uh, we had the motion. All in favor? Of, uh, it's carried. Not that I know. Sorry, I'm fine. I'm fine. It was just... Okay, I need the, ado uh, the adoption of the regular council meeting agenda for August 6th. Oh, sorry, Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, I apologize. Um, Councilor Bondi, did you, you had mentioned you had a notice of motion? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so Councilor Bondi will read it later. I just wanted the um, agenda to reflect that, that there's going to be a notice of motion as well. Thank you. Go ahead, Rob. Thanks, so just vote on it. Yeah. Okay. Item 5.1, adoption of minutes. That the minutes of the regular council meeting of July 15th be adopted as circulated. We're Councillor Bjorkman and Councillor Bowman. All in favor? Ms. Carey, thank you. 5.2, that the minutes of the special council meeting held July 15th, 2019, be adopted as circulated. Mover, please. Uh, Councillor Van Andel and Councillor Bowman, all in favor? It's carried. Thank you. Item six, oh, sorry, item 6.1 on the agenda under public presentations is a public presentation from the Essex-Windsor Solid Waste Authority. Uh, we have Eli Mattis, General Manager, and Tom Marantet, Manager of Waste Disposal, and they're here before Council this evening uh, to discuss and answer questions that Council may have about waste diversion activities at the regional landfill. If you'd like to come forward, folks, and uh, make sure you uh, turn your mic on. Thank you. Anytime you're ready, uh, gentlemen, you can start. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor and members of council for asking us to appear before you this evening. Uh, for those members of council and staff that uh, don't know me, my name is Eli Mayotis. I'm the general manager for the Essex Windsor Solid Waste Authority. I've been in the employment of the authority and its predecessor, the Waste Management Committee since 1991. Uh, accompanying me is uh, Tom Marantet. Tom uh, is a recent uh, staff member with the authority th for the past couple of years. Tom's role is the manager of waste disposal, so he's responsible for the landfill and the transfer stations and uh, two closed landfill sites. 
Also accompanying us this evening is uh, Michelle Bishop in the audience. Uh, Michelle is our uh, finance manager. So in case there are any questions that arise of a financial nature, then uh, uh, with your uh, permission, we'll ask uh, Michelle to attend up here and uh, answer any questions. We, we didn't come with any presentation or any handouts. Uh, we're here at, at your request to answer any questions that you may have about the authority in general or waste disposal, or as I hear, possibly even some waste diversion uh, uh, activities or programs. The waste diversion relates to recycling and composting and that uh, focus of the authority that isn't related to uh, uh, material that's landfilled, so keeping material out of the landfill. So with that introduction, I'll, I'll uh, pause there for your questions. Thank you. Um, questions from council. I know there was questions brought up in the past. I'm sure there's questions tonight. Council, we asked them to come forward. Uh, Councillor Bondi. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I'm glad you made it here tonight. I, I love talking about waste diversion, and I actually believe that Council should have a one-hour brainstorming session about waste diversion at some point. So any tips you have about what we could potentially do? It's been one of those topics since I've been sitting here the last six, seven years that we've always wanted to talk about. Ideas from residents that I'm hearing. Um, can we go to gar recycling every week? Can we go to garbage every other week? Can we implement green bins? In, in, in urban centers. Can we look at um, different ways to do yard waste? For example, in my household, and I consider myself a pretty green thumb, yard waste comes on a Saturday. People that have children and work, they don't get to do their yard waste until Saturday, until Saturday or Sunday. So I have to fight with my significant other to keep yard waste bags in my garage for two weeks because you can't have them outside because they can't get wet. There's not enough room in the sheds because there's all the kids' bikes in there. So what happens in, our, in my household, I will publicly admit, is our yard waste sometimes goes in the garbage because it's not easy and it's not convenient for people. So if we really want to tackle waste diversion, I really feel like there's some probably really low hanging fruit and that's one of them, right? Looking at capturing more yard waste. I was driving by today and I saw our, our town staff doing gardening at our public gardens, throwing it into garbage bags. And I thought, you know, we really need to lead by example. I, I really like some of the Essex Windsor Solid Waste Authority's initiatives on Facebook. Um, I would encourage everybody watching and listening to follow them on Facebook. Um, because everybody is, you know, there's a whole bunch of people that like recycling and there's a whole bunch of people that say recycling is, doesn't work, it costs more money. But I think the reason why it costs so much more money is because we're recycling inefficiently. Um, you know, people are throwing the wrong things in the recycle, people are throwing plastic bags in the recycle. You know, I was at a business in Harrow this week having coffee, hint, hint, and I saw the recycle bins out there. Um, and I saw the recycle truck go by, look in the bin, and he, he didn't pick it up because it was all plastic bags. And frankly, it really wasn't all recyclable material. So even, even places, businesses that we go into, we think they're recycling, a lot of times they're not. Because along with your recyclable newspaper, people are throwing in slushies, and now it's, it's contaminated, it no longer works. So I've also had requests to see if we can find another, like a yard waste bag, but not a yard waste bag for garbage, for municipal garbage, so that we're no longer using uh, plastic bags. Is there some, some other municipality out there that does, and maybe they're a different color, maybe they're light green, so garbage trucks know to pick up these paper bags, they're garbage. I'm not sure, those are some things. I'd also love, um, on my first term on council, so I'm thinking 2011, 2012, I went for a tour of the recycling plant. It was a really an eye opener because I got to see why we need to separate it. I'd love for council to have that at some point. Um, I know we do tours of the landfill, but and there are some public tours of the recycling plant, but it really is a good initiative. As a host municipality, we should really be leading the way in waste diversion. So I really think you coming here is kind of, you know, we can talk about it. How can we capture more materials? How can we recycle efficiently and how can we build that relationship to really protect our landfill and keep it around for years and years to come. Thank you, Council. Uh, Deputy Mayor Malash. Through your worship, I, I, I don't know if, um, did you want to answer some of those questions? What, was that the intention that we were going to have the questions yeah, I, answered? I think so. Can you? Thank you, uh, Mr. Malash. I, I jotted down just at the beginning there from
talking to you about uh, a couple of references, weekly recycling, garbage every two weeks, and green bin program. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about each of those. Um, regarding uh, weekly recycling, that's probably not something that's going to uh, be implemented uh, anytime. Um, what's happened across the province, there are some programs that are weekly. Essex-Windsor has bi-weekly. Uh, there's a, a transition that will be taking place in the near future in the next four, five, six years where the producers that are responsible for the products that are in the blue box and red box, where they'll be responsible for the full cost. Currently, there's a sharing of the cost, of the net cost of the blue box program. Uh, municipalities right now bear 50% of the net cost. And I say net cost because there's a cost, as you're aware, to collect the material, to process it in the recycling uh, facilities. Uh, that's the gross cost. And then deducted from that is the revenue that's earned from the sale of that material. The revenue that's earned does not cover the full cost to collect and process. So there's a net cost. Uh, the seven county municipalities in the city of Windsor are responsible for 50% of that net cost and the stewards and the producers, uh, the big corporations, they're responsible for the other 50%. The province is, is, has uh, instructed the stewards to start planning to uh, assume the full cost. What won't happen then in the near term is a enhancement to the programs. So anyone that has currently bi-weekly, they won't be able to switch to weekly uh, due to the increased cost. Uh, so th that addresses that part of it. Um, on the garbage every two weeks. Um, that would be a uh, municipal decision. That would be something that uh, would work favorably to uh, cause greater waste diversion. Um, as you know, uh, perhaps uh, residents may not fully recycle, people may recycle, but maybe their bin gets full or they forget and they throw stuff in the garbage. Same thing with organics, with the yard waste, it may end up in the garbage. But if there is refuse collection every two weeks, it may cause individuals and householders to then uh, make more and full use of their the other waste diversion activities. If you have a backyard composter, you can uh, start using that more. Uh, so that that's a local uh, decision uh, regarding garbage collection. That's a municipal responsibility, not one of the authority. So Windsor and the seven county municipalities, uh, they would have to examine that. Uh, moving on to the green bin program. As you're aware, Essex-Windsor does not have such a program. Uh, there are other municipalities in, in southwestern Ontario also that do not currently have a program. London is an example, Chatham-Kent, Stratford, Sarnia, uh, and so on. Um, the province has uh, mandated that these programs be implemented by the municipalities that currently don't have them. Uh, and they've set a target date of uh, 2025 for that to take place. The province has uh, named the municipalities that would have to be participants in that. Uh, Essex is not one of those municipalities. So if, they, if Essex wanted to do it, that, that's fine. They could, you, you could. Uh, Kingsville and Lakeshore are the others. And the criteria that the province used was population and population density to identify which municipalities would be compelled to have a green bin program. So Essex, Kingsville, and Lakeshore wouldn't be compelled, but the other four county municipalities would, as well as the city of Windsor. Uh, so uh, uh, Windsor is undertaking a study right now to see how they can make that transition. Once, what other munis municipalities have done, once a green bin program comes into effect, they have then uh, made a switch in their uh, garbage collection to bi-weekly. So once you're pulling out your kitchen scraps, uh, your, your, your dinner scraps after your cucumber peelings and, and apple cores and all of that stuff, all that food waste, once you've pulled that out of the uh, garbage stream, uh, then you wouldn't have such large uh, volumes of garbage and you wouldn't have garbage that would be sitting there and rotting. So you could go to every two weeks uh, garbage collection. So that's, that's kind of when that happens uh, historically and in the past with Ontario municipalities. They've implemented a green bin program, then they've gone uh, transition. They, they don't do it right away, but they put uh, residents on notice that uh, garbage collection will be every two weeks.
So those were the major items at the beginning that I heard uh, Councillor Bondi talking about. If there are other specific questions that I didn't address, I can address those. Deputy Mayor Malash. Thank you, through you, Your Worship, uh, to Mr. Mayos. Um, so, if the communities that uh, where will where they'll be forced to go to green bin uh, in 2025 and later, um, if we did go to an every other week pickup, would it be only be in those communities where they have the green bins? First of all. Uh, secondly, uh, I think right now the the in Essex Essex Centre still has. Uh, like our Ward 1 has a green bin pickup, but not everybody has the green bins. It was a pilot project years ago, like going back to 2000, year 2000 or before that, where uh, Essex Centre uh, participated and were able to get the green bins for scrap, food scraps and so on. Um, and we did look at it later on, and I think, uh, you know, going back to around 2010, we did look at it. And I think the bins with the cost was around $500 per household. Uh, so we had we we thought about it, but we didn't have the money to, to back it up. So we didn't move forward with it. Uh, so I probably want to know where the money would come from to initiate the program. And hopefully uh, bi-weekly pickup would only happen in those communities where the green bin pickup is, is happening. But one other question, um, if we wanted to do it in our urban centers, perhaps, rather than our rural, um, would we be invited to join as well into that in that program? Thank you, Mr. Malash. Uh, just a couple of points. I, I guess I should clarify when, when we talk about Green Bin. Um, Windsor and the seven county municipalities currently have yard waste, so that is part perhaps of what you're talking about in, in the part of your town where you have a bin, a green bin, and people are putting their yard waste in it. Um, if they are putting some food waste, um, our system isn't set up to compost food waste, but if there are minimal amounts, which I assume that there are, uh, it's not, it hasn't posed us a problem, but we're not asking people to put food waste in, the, uh, in their yard waste. So when we're talking about a new uh, green bin program, we're talking about related to food waste, and they would be two separate programs because the yard waste is managed separately and composted separately than the method that would be used for food waste. So it would be a separate type of uh, uh, system and, and collection process. Uh, I, think, I think you asked about cost. Uh, as, uh, as is garbage and is the yard waste, the, the responsibility for the cost would be with the municipalities and not with the Solid Waste Authority. There may be some monies available in the authority budget and reserves to help kickstart or um, provide some uh, education and maybe fund partially some of the cart uh, acquired uh, th that could be acquired by the municipalities. Um, so that's that's that part. I think you asked earlier about the municipalities if they implemented the food waste, they wouldn't necessarily have to go to. It's their choice to buy weekly garbage. Uh, it's it's something that could be considered because you'd have a, a cost saving on the collection side because now you have another collection cost. You have to collect the green bin in addition to your refuse. So. Uh, it's not something that's required, but, and again, it, it's each, each individual municipality's uh, option. Thank you. Through you, Your Worship. Thanks also for coming. And um, now, after listening to your, your questions, I have a handful of, uh, or answers, I have a handful of questions myself, and I'm thinking it's best if I just throw them at you and then you can just um, answer them as you feel. Um, for starters, um, when Councillor Bondi was um, commented on some of the new um, 
the new efforts, uh, you know, to s stimulate more diversion. I really like the Recycle Coach and the What Goes Where app. Those are really helpful. I think that we, we should be reaching out to more offices and businesses. Uh, since I started, uh, you know, asking about a lot of them just, just aren't even recycling. So maybe we need to focus a little harder on educating them. Now, um, the manager of waste disposal had suggested at one point that it'd be a good idea for our students to tour the recycling uh, center, the landfill and the greenhouse. And I think that that would be brilliant. And I'm just wondering if there's uh, any plans to put that in action. And about this, uh, the green bin program, you're just discussing um, this, uh, that there are a few local communities that are going to have to implement it by 2025. Now, because as you said, it is it is treated differently than the um, current uh, composting operation we have. Would we be treating the green bin product at the local site and would it be a new and different process? And I had a question here and I can't find it, but it, I'd like you to explain to council because I've just recently learned as a new member that uh, some of the members, some of the councillors aren't really familiar with the, the gas collection plant that went in, that we, that the waste authority put in in 2009 that's collecting the gas from the uh, decomposition of the garbage. And uh, the intent of it was to, um, uh, you know, be fed back into our power grid as a source of power and currently we're still I had the numbers written down but I can't find them right now um, we're flaring off all of that methane gas uh, rather than because you know the process as you people are well aware of and I'm wondering if you could make some of council aware of how we were bumped in the queue uh, by and we still haven't tied into the grid and if there's any plan for that to get back on track or if we're just going to continue to flare the methane gas that's collected out of the waste. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Verbeek. Um, so you started off uh, with talking about uh, industrial and uh, commercial institutional recycling in offices and so on. Uh, the authority's main mandate relates to uh, residential uh, waste diversion. Uh, we do try to assist with the IC, it's called the ICI sector, industrial, commercial, institutional, uh, but, but we don't have the staff and we don't have the mandate to do that because it's such a large, um, it's such a large sector. Uh, the province has also focused mainly over the past decades, my time with the authority, and as I said before that, with the Waste Management Committee, mostly on the residential sector, the province has now acknowledged that they need to put more pressure on this industrial commercial institutional sector to be more responsible with their recycling and their waste diversion. So that, that ties more to the enforcement from the province and the ministry. Uh, so we have done bits here and there uh, to, to try to assist in that. Uh, mostly tied to uh, municipalities. So if your municipality has a uh, recreation center or, or libraries, we, we try to assist that way, but we just don't have the staff and the manpower and the resources to get into the, uh, in the, into the broader sector. Uh, another point that was raised was uh, concerning uh, tours at the recycling center. In Windsor at EC Rowan Central, we have two recycling centers. One manages and receives the product from one of your boxes, the blue box, and one from the red box. Uh, that's why we ask that they be sorted by the residents at curbside, uh, because in the truck, contrary to belief by some people, it doesn't get all mixed up into the into the truck. Uh, there are two compartments in the truck. Yes, the collector is, is tipping that box into one compartment, but there's a diverter plate in there, and it sends the paper and the fibers one way and the containers, you know, such as this bottle, uh, another way. That way, when it gets to the plant, it's already somewhat pre-sorted. Uh, yes, we do have problems, as Councillor Bondi was mentioning, residents could do a little bit of a better job by not throwing a container, you know, a pop can in with the newspapers, because we may not be able to sort that at the processing facilities. Um, 
But getting back to the tour, we do have in the summertime, and I'm not sure if it'll be scheduled for this summer or, or the fall, where we have a public open house at the facility there at EC Rowan Central, and that's where we uh, we uh, show the plants and the other uh, facilities there at, uh, at that site. Uh, there's a household chemical waste facility there, there's a transfer station, there's a public depot, and that's, and that's on a Sunday when the site is closed. It's a very busy site during regular operating hours, so it's not really uh, feasible to have people going through the sites uh, and into the buildings, especially uh, you know, with younger uh, children. So that, that happens, uh, as I said, that public open house usually was uh, uh, in June. We didn't have it this June, uh, but I think it's scheduled for uh, the fall time. <clears throat> Uh, regarding uh, potential food waste processing, once Windsor does set up a system and if the uh, four county municipalities uh, come on board, and this is all in the, in the early discussion phases, uh, one of the problems across the province is it was very well and good for the province to compel municipalities to implement uh, food waste programs, but there is a shortage of processing facilities in the province and uh, once the product is created at the end, what becomes of the product? Who can use it productively? Uh, well, what is the cost? Can, can that product be charged for? Uh, so Windsor, as I mentioned earlier, is undertaking a study that they'll release uh, in the fall time as to what processing options there would be. The processing options uh, would would not include at this time because there isn't space at the regional landfill for anything to be con constructed there. Um, so that's that's one of the challenges for the municipalities. It can be collected locally and shipped to uh, you know throughout the province to any facilities that may be able to handle it. Um, there is a facility in London that uh, has undergone problems regarding odor, uh, so they've been shut down a couple of times. There is a facility in uh, Leamington that uh, may or may not be able to accept the material depending on what their capacity is. So th those are things that are currently being studied and will be studied over, over the next couple of years. None of this is going to happen fast, and the province is aware of that. They're gonna have to have consultations still with the municipalities and uh, with potential users of the product that would uh, come from that. Would it be spread on farm fields? Uh, would it be used by landscaping companies? It's, it's, that has to be determined. Uh, regarding the capture of the gas, and Tom will step in here once it gets a little bit too technical here, uh, but the landfill has uh, piping and a collection system that collects the methane gas that is generated by the decomposition of the garbage. And as Councillor Verbeek mentioned there, what, it's, what happens currently with it is it's collected and then it's flared uh, to eliminate the greenhouse gas uh, emission effect of it so that uh, the methane isn't just venting to the atmosphere and causing greenhouse gas emission problems. So that, that is a, a system that's approved by the Ministry of the Environment. Uh, that's, that's what we're doing now. And unfortunately, it looks like that's what we'll be doing uh, in the short and long term. What we were trying to do with that system, as Councillor Verbeek uh, alluded to, we were trying to get a system where that gas could be captured and then uh, uh, where it can generate, uh, uh, turn a generator and create electricity that we could sell back into the grid to the province. We tried multiple times. Uh, as you're aware, you see around you, uh, you see solar uh, panels and you see wind turbines. Uh, the province moved in that direction and it wasn't only Essex, Windsor that wasn't successful in getting a contract with the province and with Ontario Energy, uh, but similarly London was not able to, and there were some private landfills that really wanted to capture the gas and turn it into electricity and, and get it back into the grid. None of those were uh, successful for one reason or another, not related to the landfill ourself or London's landfill or the private landfills, but whatever selection criteria the province and the uh, Ontario, uh, the energy ministry was using at that time. So it doesn't look like we'll be able to uh, to harness that, but we, it is being managed in the proper environmental manner. Thank you. Is there any other questions? Uh, Deputy Mayor Malash. 
Thank you. Uh, through your worship, I just have one other uh, question or comment. Um, in uh, and Councillor Bonnie might have brought this up, but I'm not sure. But um, in following some social media trails that were where they were talking about um, different um, methods of conserving, um, doing a better job of keeping garbage out of the uh, landfill and recycling. Um, someone on the website, and he, and he didn't get back to me, but uh, mentioned that there are other communities in Ontario here, and uh, I'm not even sure if it's Ontario, to be honest with you, but he lived in another community where they were using bags for recycling rather than the containers. And the recycling trucks would pick up the whole bag and just, li just like we do with garbage for the landfill, they were picking up the whole bag and just tossing that into the truck. And I'm just wondering if you know of any other communities that are doing this, and perhaps there's a reason why we couldn't do that here in our community. Uh, thank you, Councillor. I'm not aware of any Ontario municipalities that implement a bag system like that. Uh, we're, we're, we don't want people to put their recyclables in bags. And you may recall a couple years ago where we had a campaign out. Uh, the bags cause problems at the processing facilities, getting entangled in the gears, getting entangled in the conveyors. We don't have a method to tear the bags open. Um, there isn't a system for that. That's why we ask, and, and Councillor Bondi was alluding to the plastic bags, not only a big plastic bag, but you know, don't put your newspapers in a grocery bag and just so that it's consolidated and put that in the in the blue box don't, don't do that have no no it's called plastic film any kind of plastic film like that a bag or uh even or you know a bread bag that kind of plastic should not be in the in the blue box system so i'm not sure councillor Malosh, where that could be in place but it's not a recommended method i will i'll follow up and i'll try and find out where this person was talking about it might even have been in the states because he didn't say where he had lived previously Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I do have a serious question, but first, I can't let go unchallenged uh, some comments that were made when this started from Councillor Bondi that some people want uh, regular garbage pickup every two weeks and the recycling every week. Um, there may be some people who want that, but I guarantee her that uh, there'd be riots if we tried to take weekly garbage collection away from uh, most of our neighborhoods. Um, and I say that as a, as a household that recycles everything assiduously, and, and we're usually a one bag a, a week household, but you know, all it takes is a couple of guests or a summer party, and you've got four bags, and the, the maggots are galloping. So we do not want garbage collection every two weeks. And as for the recycling every week, um, again, I rec recycle everything, and that truck goes by our house two trips out of three because we just don't fill those bins fast enough. So I think that would be a waste of diesel, which wouldn't be a good thing if you're trying to do something for the environment. But on to my, uh, my question, uh, Council, if you, we, one of the reasons we invited you here was that a few weeks ago, some of us had some questions about the daily cover that's being used at the landfill, and that's of concern to us because as the, the host community, we'd like to see that landfill last as long as possible. Um, now we understand you're using uh, automotive fluff as daily cover, and uh, we don't, because of changes in local manufacturing and uh, uh, we don't produce that much automotive fluff locally anymore, and then it's being brought in from afar. I'd, I'd like to know where it's coming from, whether any of it's U.S. sourced. Uh, I'd like to know how much uh, they're paying to dispose of the fluff here. And I also know that uh, construction people are having trouble getting rid of excess soil from construction and that they're paying other people to dispose of that soil because it's too expensive at the landfill, which is using automotive fluff instead. And we even have, even our, uh, our water treatment plants, like I, I know for, from firsthand experience that um, Union Water had 100,000 tons of, uh, of suspended particulate that it, they had removed from water uh, that they've been trying to get rid of at the landfill, but they're limited to only 2,500 tons per year. Uh, I'm wondering why we're taking automotive fluff when we have locally sourced uh, biological materials that probably would be better for the long-term life of the landfill. Thank you. Uh, 
Thank you, Councillor. Um, regarding the uh, automotive shredder residue, uh, the origin of it is a facility in Hamilton. Uh, that's that's where it comes from. Uh, the environmental compliance approval that the authority has that's that's what the kind of the permit and the license is called that the pro, that the uh, province and the ministry uh, issues to uh, waste facilities so that that environmental compliance approval that ECA allows the authority to uh, use auto shredder residue as, as a cover material and it also allows the authority to receive that material and actually any in other waste material uh, from anywhere in Ontario. So those are the two, uh, those questions come up. Uh, we're allowed to uh, accept from Ontario, although we don't, there is no waste matter aside from the shredder residue that comes from anywhere outside Essex-Windsor. Uh, we uh, charge the uh, supplier of that material $8 per metric ton. And I'll put, those are the two specific questions you had, and I'll pause there if there are any other questions with, with Tom here about operationally, what are the pros and cons, you know, why we use it, how it's used, and so on. So I'll, I'll pause there uh, once I've, uh, I've answered those two questions specifically. Councillor Burby, you had... Uh, no. Okay, go ahead. Yep. Just to expand on the use of uh, ASR, the shredder fluff that you had uh, originally mentioned, um, the two percent that that you stated that that speaks to the uh, the um, sewage sludge, which is a different component than I think you're speaking of uh, the hundred thousand tons. I, I'm not sure that 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 I've heard that number, but I believe that's grit that would be coming from. Uh, from your water treatment plants. I know we received some of that from um, town of Leamington. Uh, we do use that for cover material, but that is grit that's been stored for a number of years uh, to allow it to dry out so that, you know, it, it's, it's useful as cover material. So um, obviously we wouldn't use the, the sludge as, as cover material because um, of its nature. Um, but shredder fluff we do use as a cover material. We do use uh, clean fill if it's uh, available. And, and we do use the, um, the grit from the water reclamation plants. The problem is, is that we need a steady supply. And so, um, you know, there was talk about um, the correlation between tonnage received and how much cover do we need. Um, we always try to minimize the square area face of garbage that we're working in, only because at the end of the day, we, we know we have to cover it. Um, so whether it's clay or shredder fluff or um, some other material that, that has come in that can be used for that purpose, um, it makes our job easier. It's less machine wear, um, less time for the operators. So we will stockpile that material next to the location where we're landfilling and we'll cover the garbage at the end of the night. So again, um, we may be in a situation and, and landfilling is a very dynamic sport at the landfill. Uh, we may be uh, landfilling in a trench one day because we've received some contaminated soil and we'll strip that off down to the garbage so we have a good hydraulic connection and now we're basically landfilling in a trench um, so our containment area is very small um, we have that contaminated soil that we can now use for cover plus we have the shredder residue or or grit or whatever was brought in that we've stockpiled we don't typically stockpile any daily cover material, um, but that's the beauty of shredder fluff is it comes in periodically through, throughout the day, maybe uh, four or five loads a day, sometimes more, sometimes less. Uh, we will stockpile it next to where we're landfilling and then it can be easily pushed over. Um, you know, the, the beauty of, of that fluff, it's, it's light. 
and it's being placed right where we need it. If we don't, if we don't have the benefit of some of that material, we have to truck it from other parts of the site. Now we incur expense with an excavator, the rock truck, wear and tear. We have to maintain and or rebuild roads to the stockpile site to get the clay to where we need it. And, you know, based on the tonnage, um, the trip in the rock truck is 25 tons. It may take, you know, 10 minutes to get a, a load there. So you can imagine over the course of the day, it's an exercise to get enough material to provide cover. And that ASR fluff um, and other light cover materials also uh, aid in uh, increasing the capacity, the ultimate capacity of the landfill because it's, it's just by the nature, it compresses, it compacts. Um, so we're not filling up the landfill with a lot of, a lot of dirt. If we have a situation where we have a, a holiday or a long weekend, yeah, we'll, we'll do our best to, to haul some clay in to try and get some extra cover on the material. But as a daily cover, shredder fluff um, really is, is a good product. Uh, I'd like to thank Mr. Rantet for the uh, comprehensive answer. Uh, I live near the, uh, the landfill and obviously the covering system works because we almost never smell anything. So that's, that's great. And I realize you can't use uh, sewage sludge. And yes, the, the stuff I was talking about from Union Water was suspended grit from the lake water and it's, uh, it is historic. It's been there for many years. Uh, and in your defense, it's high in aluminum because of what they use to precipitate the grit. So I know that's a concern for you too. I just ask these questions because some people, I just want to make sure that the local people who need to use the dump aren't being uh, excluded in favor of fluff from elsewhere. But thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, was there any other counselor Verbeek? Thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, just circling back around to the recycling, I remember a few years back there was an issue with, um, like, uh, you know, um, the recycle symbol on the bottom of containers with the number in it, uh, or plastic containers is what I'm referencing. And um, our site only recycled certain numbers. And um, so it was, you know, creating an issue at sorting, right? And we still have people that are seeing that symbol and they're throwing it in the box and it's ending up at the uh, recycle facility. I'm wondering if there's any plans to take more of the numbers that we don't like, say, I, I'm not sure, is it five and six we don't take, the different ones that we do, is there any, um, any plans to take more of the plastics or has or are we now and also i just also wanted to just circle back i to thank you for your answer on that glass gas collection uh system but just to also comment that i i i get that we're you know we're we're meeting the ministry's um guidelines uh in in how and what we flare clearly it'd be great if we weren't flaring the methane off and if we could use this gas created by the waste and um, harness it and sell it back to the grid for revenue. Um, I, I remember our past site manager, Ralph Reiser, would come to us and we'd be this close and he'd say, we've been bumped in the queue by wind turbines and, and solar again. So we weren't ever getting to the head of the queue there with um, to have it generated into a power source and sold back to the grid. I'm wondering if there's any plans in the future to, to look at that again and, and try and push that agenda a little bit. Thank you. Thank, thank you again, Councillor. Just uh, on, on your last point, the province has no plans or programs to purchase electricity. They're just not going to do it. There, there, there isn't any plan or program. Um, so they've, they've nixed all of that. Uh, regarding uh, the, the recycling symbol on containers, and uh, I'll bring this to our waste diversion manager maybe for, for messaging, uh, and this is not blaming residents because we can't know everything about everything, uh, but simply because there is one of those recycling loops doesn't mean that something's recyclable. Uh, and 
so m maybe we need to send some messaging out about that. Uh, in answer to the question about expanding any materials that uh, that are in the program, no, there isn't any uh, plan to expand. No municipalities are going to be expanding really anything that they take. Uh, there's um, yes, there's a environmental benefit, but uh, there's a net cost to adding anything to the program, and you need a buyer for the for the material. Uh, that that's a problem. Uh, uh, lately uh, you need buyers for what is in the blue box uh, so there's no point in collecting it if no one will then acquire it from you afterwards I think that addresses your questions <clears throat> thank you any other questions councillor Vandendal sorry one one quick one that was left over from the last time we talked about this a few months uh, ago through you mr. chair what is the expected life expectancy of of the, the landfill these days thank you our, our current estimate is to 2040 uh, the landfill was opened in 1997 the original plan was for it to uh, exist for 25 years uh, we've exceeded that uh, and we'll we'll exceed it uh, beyond that uh, and how we're trying to uh, make the maximum use out of the capacity is something that mr. Marin had described where uh, it's a very technical process, landfilling refuse. It's not just digging a hole and throwing stuff in it. Uh, we try to acquire the, the proper machinery and equipment to compact that garbage to, as I call it, squish as much as we can into the envelope. So the ministry has allowed us to go a certain depth underground, the low grade, and a certain height. And it's Tom's job and his staff and, and, and the people that work at the landfill to make the maximum use of that envelope to get uh, as much garbage as possible to fit in there. Uh, so our estimates right now are to 2040. Any other questions? Um, I, I just have one quick question. Do we own the property on the opposite side of the road? for future there, development for landfill? There are a few parcels across the street from the landfill to the south. We don't own all of the parcels. The, when I say we, it's the county of Essex, so the authority technically doesn't own any uh, land. Uh, if the land is in the county, the county of Essex owns the land. If the property is in Windsor, then the city of Windsor owns it. But in, to answer your question, uh, not all the properties across the street are owned by the county. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I just want to thank you both for coming very much and answering all our questions. But um, I just wanted to just make a statement that this uh, this 20, 2040, the life expectancy to 2040, I've been a member of the Landfill Liaison Committee for over 13 years. And every year, it, we can we can thank this committee. Uh, um, uh, Tom, Mr. Marintet, and his predecessor, Ralph Reiser, for their operations and their staff at the site. They're like, I, every year, like, I mean, we listen to the numbers of the, the waste and the compaction, and they're, they're just squishing every little inch out of that site that they possibly can. And uh, it's thanks to them that we've got this many years left in it. Thank you, Councillor. I agree 100% with what you're saying. Um, but thank, thank both of you for doing your presentation tonight. I'm going to need a motion to uh, to accept the presentation, please. Uh, Councillor Bowman and Councillor Vandendal. All in favor? It's carried. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you for your time tonight. Item 6.2 item 6 under public presentations this evening is a presentation on cyber insurance coverage. And this is in conjunction with Information Technology Report 2019-01, uh, uh, which, which looks for Council's approval this evening uh, for the purchase of the cyber liability insurance coverage. Uh, here on behalf of the town's insurance provider is Wally McNeely. Uh, he's an account executive with AON Risk Solutions, and he's here this evening to provide council with a general overview uh, as well as answer any questions that the councillors may have. Thank you, Rob. 
Anytime you're ready, you go, go ahead. Great, thanks for having me over everybody. Um, glad to be part of your meeting. Cyber insurance is uh, uh, on the, on the up and up, I would say, in our industry in the last few years. I mean, I've been taking care of the risk management services for the town the last five years or so. And um, five years ago, cyber insurance wasn't even really on the radar. You know, now in the last few years, we've been seeing other municipalities, Meadford, Wasaga Beach, Stratford. Um, you can look in your local uh, papers in those areas and really see the impact. Um, criminals are, are, are getting more sophisticated with the access to the internet. Um, with malware, um, I mean, I was talking to Jack earlier. I mean, we can all have the best firewalls in our system, um, but we're only as good as our weakest employee in the back office when they open up that attachment and let in the virus. Um, so we've been seeing some significant claims. I mean, uh, in, in the note from Jack, you'll see reference to Wasaga Beach. I think there was a malware ransom on a Monday, a registered letter, and um, they had their own IT department. And uh, it was only $35,000, basically it was um, in, in the equivalent of Bitcoin, which is pretty, pretty standard. So they figured they're gonna try to um, isolate it, get back to business, and uh, manage it themselves. And uh, at, at the end of the day, 35 days, I think later, they paid the ransom and um, about a quarter million dollars in soft costs, um, outsourcing uh, over time, those other things. And that was just, you know, one example. Um, but typically there's a lots of extra costs that go in and above beyond a, a breach in a cyber uh, malware episode. You got the notification to all the staff, um, files that have been um, compromised. Now it's regula regulated that you have to go out and notify all these members that uh, the files have been breached. Um, with the policy in particular that we've put forward with Beasley, it will it'll respond to 50,000 um, uh, members or, or breach uh, uh, individuals. Um, it'll also pay um, up to a million dollars of malware uh, ransom and all the expenses that go with that. Um, it's like a, a one, one limit policy. I think the premium, if I'm not mistaken, is uh, about uh, $14,865. So, um, we're looking for approval on that to get the $1 million limit. Um, that way we can put this policy in place. Um, there is a gap in the current insurance program. That's why we're providing the quote and uh, hopefully the, the council sees some, some uh, importance in it. So with the coverages, with the coverages uh, specifically, it's gonna cover um, any regulatory fines, all the forensics that go into it, all the um, computer assistance, account um, lawyers, um, all the notification, um, all the uh, kind of background work to make sure it doesn't happen again um, with the, the forensics behind it. So uh, something to consider. Um, we've been talking about it a few months. Um, I would say most of the uh, municipalities are looking at it pretty seriously in the last year or so um, with the percentages of uh, municipalities that have been targeted. I mean, we all have our own email accounts and we kind of all see how many times people are trying to put things in your face, click here, you know, you get the, the, the fake um, revenue candidate emails or the banks that you don't belong to, they're trying to get you to click on certain things. Employees within your organizations are clicking on these things, uh, unfortunately, even though they're told not to. So um, you can have the best systems in place, but at the end of the day, you can um, allocate a little bit of money, resources to mitigating uh, you know, the risk down, down the road with having all the professionals at your services. That way you can continue running the municipality and not dealing with all the other things that go on and try to uh, get business back to normal when a forensic, uh, when, a, when a cyber episode happens. So. Um, I see it with a lot of manufacturers and different industries. Um, municipalities are not really, they're just as um, susceptible to that risk as well. There's no industry that's really not picked on anymore when it comes to uh, cyber crime. So there's people all over the world that have, there's, there's um, corporations that specifically have employees there that make six figures that are just targeting your employees and, and, and uh, trying to get into your system. So um, by purchasing uh, this layer of protection, you can uh, um, have a little peace of mind. So I'll leave it with you guys. If you have any questions too, um, with respect to how claims are handled, um, 
I can answer those more specifically. But in a nutshell, it's basically a 1-800 number for your team, your administrative team to call, and then they got all the, the people at their fingertips to kind of run when something happens, so. Good, thank you. Any uh, questions from council? Deputy Mayor Malash. Thank you for coming out this evening. Yeah. Um, my, one question that I do have, uh, when I first looked at this, I thought to myself, why don't we just self-insure? Because I'm looking at the uh, ransom that was the 34950 and I'm going, two years, we'd have that covered. But then again, once I started reading the report, I realized there's a lot of other costs associated with and, and all those other items, the background of the lawyers and, and so on that are attached to this as well. So the costs would be a lot higher than just the ransom. Um, but I'm wondering, I didn't see anything about a deductible in here. Is it 100% covered? No, there will be retention. I, uh, if I recall, I think it's $5,000 off the top of my head on the quote. So the first $5,000 would be out of pocket. Um, there's a lot of costs, like you said, that, you know, I was just sitting down with um, an IT company locally and they were kind of telling me about what they're seeing. I sat through lunch and learned with them and they're seeing generally seven to eight times a ransom. It's what they're paying out in soft costs and extra costs uh, generally. You know, I mean, it all depends on how sophisticated uh, the corporation is, but that's what they're seeing. Thank you very much. Uh, my se second part to my question uh, goes to Mr. Barron, our um, manager of IT. And um, Jack, I just, I just wondered, you've gone through this obviously, and, and uh, anything that you feel that we should be covered is covered in this policy if we adopt this? Uh, for you, Your Worship. Um, yes, after reviewing the policy, it looks like um, this is our first go at it as well. So uh, I work with uh, all the other municipalities. We discuss cyber insurance uh, usually at you know one of our meetings here and there. So through everything, it looks like it's covered, but there's always you know there may be something that's just unforeseen at the moment. But it is very comprehensive. again to Mr. Barron. Uh, so are there other, that was my other part of my question too, was uh, locally here, are our other municipalities, our neighboring municipalities, are they looking at uh, covering themselves on this type of insurance as well? Or uh, have they? They're, they either have it or they're looking at it and it has been budgeted. Any other questions, Councillor Van Endel? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to uh, uh, Mr. Barron, uh, are there other providers of this insurance? Because this uh, premium seems pretty steep. Thank you. I believe we just are going through this because that's our main insurance provider, so it's a bundled. If um, I'm uh, Rob, if that's correct. Um, yeah, the AON's our current provider. Yes. This was a, this was an add-on or endorsement to the current town policy, and and, and this was the quote um, uh, to Councillor Vander Dolan's questions, um, and and perhaps uh, Wally could speak to it as well. Is um, I, I would I would suspect that this is in line or better with existing like from other uh, the particular insurance company that's being recommended. Um, yeah. I don't know if you can speak to uh, whether that's in line with other other insurance companies yeah we're a broker so aon is a broker we we would shop out your insurance so um so we have a panel of cyber experts in toronto that basically i sat down with jack and, and robert filled out an application they shopped it out for us um there likely could be other options for limits you know if you wanted to save money we, we gave basically a one two and five million dollar limit option you can reduce that if you're looking at saving costs generally by the size of the municipality and the amount of people and files you take, you take on hand, you know, $50,000 limit, the premium basically is payable uh, based on that that number of uh, files. So 50,000 files would be uh, a number that I, you know, we kind of said, well, it might be a effect. If you're looking at, at uh, reducing the number of um, you know, how many files they would respond to, you can look at reducing the premium. However, yeah, it's something to consider. Um, if you're looking at the price on its own. Yeah, it's 
a, a supplementary question there. Uh, so that's about a, a dollar per head per resident. I'm interested through you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Barron, what, what are other communities paying uh, per population? That I'm, I'm not aware of. Because I think we should compare that. Um, you know, just because Midland got stung for 34,000, I mean, for all we know, the you know the, the head of the yard was uh, was running their IT or something. They might not have their own IT person. I mean, there may be a good reason why they got soaked like that. But uh, like, if there's a cheaper way we can do this, I think we should look for it. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor. Uh, questions? Councillor Bondi? If I can, to yeah. uh, through your worship, uh, I just to add on to that, you asked if there's other competitive insurance. Uh, Anne went through a competitive bid process to be our insurance company several years ago. So this is an adder to that. This is something that we would look to carry moving forward and would be part of that um, entire RFP package. So. Um, no, although we didn't look for specific bids on this, as an insurance company as a whole, they've they won our competitive bid and give us good service that way. So, Councillor Bondi. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I don't, I don't like spending the money either, but I think it is something we have to do. Um, I don't like the five thousand dollar deductible, right? Like that's like. Eh! Just wondering, uh, through you, your worship, to uh, Mr. Barron, is there anything that we do on an ongoing uh, training basis to have our staff recognize um, recognize when a risk is coming? Like, for you know, I get spam emails too, and once in a while, I'm like, hey, yeah, I want to go to Hawaii, you know, for two hundred dollars. So, do we have? Is there anything else that we can do for risk management and prevention in house that's low cost that? That make you know I I want to pay the I want to pay the insurance but I never want to use it I never want to use it ideally right I don't I don't want to pay the five thousand dollar deductible after so I'm looking for the other risk management. We we constantly look at uh, our filters, our antivirus, our everything. It's um it's luckily we haven't been hit, but it's a matter of when. Uh, lower tier municipalities are the new target because usually they only have an IT department of one or two people. So, and usually because they're small government, their uh, their software may may not be up to date. So they're they're a target. So we constantly um, look at and review, and we're in planning progress of kind of diversifying our network to pull some things out. So if there ever is uh, an instance that we do get attacked, so we we can re recover quickly. So. Um, so yeah, the insurance part, uh, unfortunately, it's nowadays it's like having house insurance or car insurance. It's just part of it. I can, I, if I may, just for a moment, I can talk about just what some other companies or corporations are doing to mitigate the risk for their own staff, I think, if that's what you're alluding to. I, I, I've just recently sat down with a fellow from a bank, um, commercial banker, and what he's done with his employees is they've hired a company to sample their staff. They'll pick staff out and they will try to infiltrate them, uh, have a plan to try to get them to click on click, clickbait. And from talking to him, he's saying once they center these employees out, that typically 70% of them fail. So, and this is a large Canadian bank. So if you can, I think embarrassment would, might work a little bit with, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, getting people to the table, you know, with, <laughs> but it, you know, a human error is a big one. And I think once uh, the, you kind of show, show the, um, the effects of maybe what, they, what they're doing, I mean, sometimes it's, um, they can be so, it's come across as so harmless, but it can be a major, major, major breach. What, what companies, what they're doing is they basically sit in the background in your in your systems and, and it could be there for months, you know, so um, um, the good thing was with this policy also, there's if there's something in your systems right now, there's no nose on it, they'll pick it up right now. So, just something. Councillor Bjarkman. 
Thank you, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, thank you very much for explaining this and, and Jack for helping us uh, to, to really get a grasp. And I agree with Councillor Bondi. I never want to use it. But I never want to use any of the insurance I own. Um, but we carry it for those times when it comes along. Uh, I've got insurance on my computer at home. I've got insurance to, you know, we, we pay, we don't insurance, but we pay for the, uh, um, the, the firewall. We pay for the, we make sure we have those things in place. And, you know, we lost everything on a hard drive one time and uh, the cost is much more than just the dollars. It's the hours, it's the aggravation, it's the everything that it takes to come back. So uh, I, I, again, I think it's worth having just because in this day and age, we depend on these systems. We have to have these systems working. If we go down with our system for an extended amount of time, it, it, it hurts our residents. Um, so it's, it's another, uh, you know, tool that we need to have that uh, that protects us. And when something does happen, we've got somebody to uh, uh, back that up. And I agree, the deposit uh, you could take that trip, but uh, we we we'll, or not the deposit, but the the uh, deductible. Thank you for that word. So, anyways, I, I agree, we need to go this route. It, that is the way it is today, and we need to protect ourselves. Thank you, Councillor Rob. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, just to actually just following from that on the the uh, question about the deductible, the the five thousand dollar deductible is actually quite low by industry standards, and I certainly, with respect to other elements of our insurance package, uh, we have much higher deductibles. Our CGL deductible is much higher than five thousand dollars, so this is actually a by industry standards a very reasonable deductible. Any other questions? Councillor Verbeek, you had a question, no? Okay, I think, hmm? Well, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna have to have a motion to accept the presentation first. Okay, if, would you, or we could do it all in one if you want. Okay, would you like to do it all in one? Okay, go ahead, make your, uh, make your motion, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, just that we um, accept the report and approve um, the recommendations. Thank you, uh, Seconder, uh, Councillor Bjorkman. All in favor? It's carried. Great, thanks for having me, guys. Leave some cards here if anybody has any specific questions afterwards, okay? Our third presentation, public presentation this evening, is uh, concerning the Town of Essex Trap, Neuter and Release TNR program. Uh, we have here this evening, uh, Ms. Jen DeRook and Ms. Laura Brittenbaugh. Uh, and they're here to speak with council this evening about concerns uh, about the TNR program, recent concerns, and actually as a, as a result of those concerns that administration received in uh, late June, um, council on July 2nd did give direction to administration uh, to review the program and come back with recommendations largely concerned uh, revol revolving around recommendations if any as far as uh, public education and uh, increased or enhanced oversight or, or administration relating to the program itself uh, including oversight of the volunteers um, so council also has before it this evening uh, legal and legislative services report to 2019-20 on the trap, neuter, and release program uh, with recommendations or seeking direction of council to move forward with those uh, recommended and proposed reforms. Um, and before we go to our delegates, I would be entirely remiss if I didn't also mention that um, uh, Melanie Coulter, uh, Executive Director of the Windsor-Essex <coughs> County Humane Society, uh, she's graciously offered her time uh, this evening. Um, so if, if council has any questions about TNR programs in general, or TNR um, practices or best practices. Um, she's offered to answer those questions um, uh, should that be council's wish. Uh, but first and foremost, we, we have our, our two delegates uh, before council this evening. Mr. Mayor, I just have a point of information regarding Melanie. She's on her way. She's not here. She's not here yet. She's on her way. <laughs> That's okay. <clears throat> Okay, uh, ladies, uh, whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and start. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name's Jen, and I live in Tully Meadows on Oak Drive, across the road from um, where all this took place, where these cat houses were set up and where they were being fed. Uh, 
Um, I'm here just to give you a brief rundown on what happened to us uh, because I believe that we're not an isolated incident. Um, if caregivers are set up with this program, I believe there are other people out there just like us that are just as frustrated as we were um, and what a frustrating three years it's been for us. We endured uh, cat urine and feces all over our yard. We had to replace our front landscaping because uh, that was one of their favorite spots to spray. Uh, I love to garden and um, in my backyard when I'd garden, I'd be picking weeds and luckily I'm not um, still having children, but I would pick weeds and pick up cat feces at the same time. So that's kind of a health hazard for pregnant women. Um, so we endured that in our backyard. We also, um, the program was set up um, with the TNR being done, but every spring we seem to have an increase in kittens, which doesn't quite follow the what should happen with the program, but we would see these kittens, they'd be in our yard, and we have a little terrier who would go out and didn't like kittens very much, so would attack them, and unfortunately my daughter was the witness to this many times. Um, I had to go to the vet many times with these kittens and endure the costs from that. Um, we also, as you can see, we were very frustrated with this. We didn't know where to turn uh, when all this was happening because we just thought someone's feeding them, what do we do, don't know what to do. Um, the answer came for us in the spring when my neighbor Michelle brought out the cat houses that were across the road. And the next day the volunteers showed up to pick them up, were very angry. Um, we talked to them then. So over the years, it kind of made sense that over the years we noticed an odd car sitting out there with people sitting in it, which we thought was very weird and unsettling. Um, but again, we didn't know who they were, or what was going on. But once I found out um, that they had this set up, I thought, okay, that was them. They were kind of scouting out our neighborhood and we didn't know anything about it. Um, after this confrontation with the volunteers, I did my research on the program and I found uh, that the feral cats, it's a trap, neuter, and release program, and they bring them back to the area they were released, which is great. But they don't have to be fed. Um, I talked to Melanie Coulter myself and went on many websites. Um, they're feral cats, they're wild animals, they will survive on their own. They, I believe in our neighborhood, because of the food being left out, it attracted more. They were telling their friends, this is a great area, come on over, you can live here and get fed, and so we had many cats. We did not see a decrease in the cats. Um, we also, um, sorry, lost my spot. Um, just from my research that, that uh, feeding them isn't an essential part of the program um, and that they have an ability to hunt and feed for themselves. Um, I think that bringing this forth to you as council, I hope that um, other people with these concerns, like I said, um, I believe that we're not an isolated incident. Once we brought this forth, now for some reason all the cats are gone from our neighborhood because there's no caregiver set up. Um, I think they were moved somewhere else, so someone else now has our problem. I hope that those people with um, you guys taking a step forward in this and maybe making rules for these TNR volunteers to follow, um, that these people ha will have somewhere to go to voice their concerns. And um, I hope that uh, the town considers um, the fact that you know feral cats are wild and can survive on their own and ed educate the volunteers on this point. There's a human element to this. Um, the neighbors need to have a say if someone's going to set up a feeding station in their neighborhood. You need to have a consensus from everyone around that, okay, yes, we agree, this is great. We'll do this, we can, you can trap, neuter, release these cats, we'll feed them. But if someone doesn't agree with that, I don't believe it should be forced on anybody. We've had, we just this. I only mentioned a few things that we had to go through, there were many more. Yeah, so anyways, um, by reading the suggestions that you put forth, um, I believe that it's headed in the right direction. And I really hope that, um, from what I understand of the TNR programs, that they're very beneficial and that I hope that if run properly in the future, um, that it'll be very successful, that you won't have the issues that happened in our neighborhood. I thank you for our time. And if you want to know more about what happened, I have more. I just don't have the time to tell you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Um, hi. Uh, is that thing working? Yeah. Okay, my name's Laura Brittenbaugh and I live across the street um, at Two Oak Drive. I've lived there for 10 years. Um, 
And for at least the last two of these years, every time I walked out my front door, I was witness to what was going on across the street. Uh, with the cat trapping boxes, uh, cat housing, cat food, um, all behind our mailboxes in the bushes, and the nightly feedings with the flashlight, uh, very kind of creepy. But um, all this was being put up against Michelle's fence and on her property and road allowance. And so I'm the one that started, uh, that took most of the pictures because I felt this was becoming a problem and I wanted to record the situation. So I'm attending this meeting tonight just to share my thoughts about the TNR program that's being run in the town of Essex, but especially in Telly Meadows. Um, this past spring was horrible for all of us. Uh, no permission was given from anyone on our street to trap, house, or feed stray cats. Um, it's been an eyesore to say the least. Um, there have been like more cats and wildlife in the area coming to feed on the leftovers. Uh, we are all for the trap, neuter, neuter, and release of stray cats. It's a great way to cut down on the strays, but still keep the rodents, you know, in the area at bay. Um, but I feel that we all must be informed about, like, what's taking place in our neighborhood. Uh, we need to be asked if we want to participate in this program. And um, we need to be informed about what will happen to our neighborhood in the long term from this, such as like, if we use the TNR voucher program for the feral cats, like if we use it ourselves, are they then microchipped to whoever brings them in? And does that make us like legal caregivers of the cats we trap? Because we were told that they have to be fed or they'll starve to death. Or do we call the TNR program for the trapping of stray or feral cats and then the cats belong to them, which brings us back full circle with uh, the cat condos and the feeding stations. Um, I'd like, you know, I'd hate to see any residents or someone's curious child or pet getting bitten or scratched by a feral cat or other wild animals lurking around the mailboxes and in around our homes during, uh, due to the housing and the food being left uh, unattended. Uh, in closing, I'd like to say that, you know, I do agree 100% with my neighbor Michelle's recommendations and proposed bylaws concerning uh, the Essex TNR program, as this was a gray area, and we as homeowners shouldn't have to deal with these TNR volunteers ourselves. Uh, I think that people should be given the town resources to help in situations, and there should be a clear and publicized manner to get information and to share concerns, and it should be managed by the town. Um, I thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, ladies, for yeah. the presentation. Any uh, questions from council? Councilor Verbeek. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, delegates, for coming and uh, sharing your story with us. And um, I, I've been following it on social media and talking to a lot of people, and it's everybody involved has been very passionate. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sorry that you and your neighborhood have experienced this program in such a, a negative way recently. And. Um, I, I, but I don't want to focus on that, okay, because that's all done now, and I'd like to move forward in a positive way. Um, and I wonder if you have had a chance to look over um, the the work that the administration has done moving forward with this program, um, and if, if if you like all these recommendations as much as I do, I think they will work for all, all sides of it. Um, thank you. Yeah. I, oh no, I was just going to say I did. I did re look over that, and uh, I was I was happy with those. You know, because yeah, we need to know who's in our neighborhood. Like they can't come in unidentified vehicles at nighttime, and it's so it's nice to know. And so yeah, I was happy with that when I read it. Yeah, right. It did. It did. Yeah. Any other questions, Councillor Van Endel? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, uh, thanks very much for your presentation. Um, I understand the, the, I say this first of all as a cat lover, I have an indoor cat and I feed an outdoor feral cat, but we're in a rural area. Mm -hmm. um, I understand you had problems with the cats and I, I've seen these 
cat houses elsewhere in the community and saw what they did. But it sounds like almost you had more problem with the volunteers than you did with the cats. Is that true? No. No, because we got more and more cats. Like, we only had like five feral cats, okay, that that was in the neighborhood and they kept the mice down. They, we were all fine with that. And having them fixed and released back into our neighborhood, I actually missed them. But what happened was we ended up getting more and more and this lady was coming out at 10.30 at night and and then, you know, shining her flashlight and all these cats were coming out of, out of the woodwork. Cats that I no longer recognized as like our neighborhood cats, you know. And my neighbor did feed them. She topped them off in her backyard, give them a little food. So they, it wasn't like they were totally um, dependent, you know, on mice and stuff like that. They had a little bit of topping up. I am not a cat uh, hater. I love cats. I have three. One I took off the street, matter of fact, who was injured and she now lives with me, you know, so. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Councilor Bondi. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I would start by saying in a perfect world, you know, outdoor cats would be few and far between because I think out, everybody says to us, why do you have dog tags when you do nothing for cats? Well, I would, I would love to do something for cats, but I don't think it's political. there's political appetite for it because it's so hard to enforce. It's such a huge file, right? It'd take us three years to get through it. So I don't think we're there. I think our administration has done a well-researched report trying to know that there's always room for improvement in anything we do, right? Like we can definitely improve on it. I'd love to see a bylaw that says if you feed cats within three days they're fixed mm -hmm. or you know you get you have a plan to fix them that's hard to enforce right I really feel that feeding outdoor cats without them being fixed is part of the problem I also am one of those more of a bleeding hearts where I feel like if cats have been fed by humans they become dependent on being fed by humans too right. so to take away a food source no matter what time of the year I feel it it's kind of cool and I've also since I've been on council I've been probably one of the more animal well welfare advocates throughout the region I've been approached by I have people that I consult for snakes and birds uh, my snake lovers my bird lovers hate the fact that feral cats are eating snakes and birds right if you talk to birders songbirds and mm -hmm. and people we talk about mortality of animals right the people that talk about uh, in, I just was at Ojibwe with the snake skin getting an identified you know those people hate uh, feral cats eating snakes and eating birds so I do believe that it's better to feed them you know um, not on my property but where where the feeder was the problem with this situation from what I see mm -hmm. is there was a feeder in 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 your area right and I think the volunteers had good intentions coming in to fix it with some maybe actions that that weren't well known in the community that that we're working on that administration has highlighted I just want to touch all of my uh, notes here so TNR is a very humane approach um, I've I haven't heard I've been on council now nine years this and and everybody that complains about animals throughout the county does complain to me a lot I have not heard about another issue um, I have it, and I hope that we do, right? Because let's if there's more issues to fix, let's fix them. Hey, let it be known that Essex Council wants to hear about the issues. In 2010, when I was knocking on doors, cats, I swear, I will swear in a Bible, was the number one issue in Harrow. What are you going to do about the cats? What are you going to do about the cats? Now we've been fixing the cats, and it's no longer an issue. Now it's a police presence. But, um, so I just want to say, Michelle has prepared us really well. Like, mm -hmm. you just kind of came and put a face to it, but right. she is, she's done a lot of homework on this file. I mm -hmm. believe all of council has, has read everything she sent. She's put hours and hours into it. I mm -hmm. agree with Councillor Verbeek. Yes, we're, we're going to take notes of this but we do want to move forward because the program has success and it has merit there's a few hiccups with anything with anything we do it has a few hiccups this is one of them but um, overall I thank you for bringing the problems to our attention I from a, an outsider not living in your community I see the issue as um, possibly a feeder issue not so much the volunteers the volunteers you know we could have let it be known a little bit more that the volunteers were there I also remember like I recall like our volunteers are doing a lot they don't they're doing it for the best interest of the cats they're driving these cats in you know there are other programs that homeowners can do before we had this town program when there was pockets of cats 18 10 plus cats people 
in the community would all get together and pitch in vouchers. And then, and then that's how that pocket would get fixed. So it was using a whole neighborhood of vouchers for one area. And, and, that, and then the, the cats were registered back to different people. And I know this firsthand because every year we've had vouchers, I've had vouchers in my name. I've done it. And I don't, I've never had one cat. I've done it as part of the program. So this is a solution for trappers to go into areas where cats are fed and fix a lot of cats in that area without using everybody else's vouchers. It's also a program where people that can't, there's a lot of older people, senior people, people that work, people that have kids that can't drive the cats in. This is a tool in our municipality to go above and beyond the normal voucher program that all municipalities have now here. So it's worked out really well. Of course, there's always glitches. And also, uh, Melanie Coulter from the Humane Society is here now if anybody has questions. I just have a few responses to your comments, just because um, you said that the animals, you believe that they're better off being fed, that if they've been fed, they won't survive on their own. And I know Melanie, I talked to her, will talk about this. That's not true. They have an innate ability to hunt. They can survive on their own. So you said that they wouldn't thrive. They will. They'll be, and she will talk about that. Um, you also said that the volunteers aren't part of the problem. They are a big part of the problem. They're not very professional. Um, we had some horrible dealings with them on social media. And they need to be educated. Um, if they're going to represent you, I would not want these people representing me as a community. Um, they need to be educated how to talk to people, um, how to have the right facts. TNR is trap, neuter, and release. It's not trap, neuter, release, and care give. Um, the caregiving is not part of it. One of the volunteers, I won't say her name, will not trap, neuter, and release unless she has caregivers set up. So that is not part of it. She needs to be educated on that. And you can't support that. Your council can't support you in that. Makes me angry. Okay, sorry, that's yeah. it. Well, oh, and I, sorry, any other problems? Yeah. You say you've never heard any other problems? We had three years of problems. We didn't know who to turn to. I think once you get this out there, um, You'll have more people come forward with problems of people feeding cats beside them and being overrun by cats. Like, I used to like cats. I don't so much anymore. <laughs> Thank you for your time. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? <clears throat> I can just say one thing. I'm sorry you women had to go through this, and we are making improvements. We have made some improvements, and we're always looking to improve on the program. So, sorry you had to go Thank through you. that. Thank, Thank you. you. Is there any Questions from council here to Melanie. She's here tonight. Has anybody uh, got any questions for Melanie at all? No, I see none. Okay, thank you for your presentation, and I need a motion uh, to accept the presentation. Councillor Verbeek. Oh, sorry, just accept the presentation, oh. and report, and direction to move forward. Yeah, I need direction to move forward too. Please. Uh, Councillor. Mr. Chair, if I could add a few words to this, to further and better educate the public and the volunteers of the program, uh, the yeah, volunteers that's about the program, because apparently, yeah. Yeah. It, just, it says it, just educate the public, it says here. Volunteers. I'd like to add, and the volunteers. The and volunteers, so. yeah. And I'm sure that's what these ladies are looking for, too. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, seconder? Thank you. Councillor Bowman? All in favor? Oh, you have a question, Councillor Bowman? Go ahead. I was just going to say, uh, um, Melanie has driven out here today. Maybe we should uh, give her a couple minutes to make a pre or make a few comments, as, if she wishes, before we vote on the issue. We, we, uh, we asked if there was any questions, and nobody had no. any questions here. I asked. If, if somebody has questions for Melanie here. Melanie, if you want to come forward, please. Or withdraw the motion you want to withdraw the motion now so Melanie can speak can you you made the motion okay withdraw okay Melanie if you'd like to come forward yeah. 
apologize for being late. I had another meeting that ran long. So I'm happy to answer questions. I think the one thing that I want to mention is that this is a, a really great program that the town has implemented. It, it expands on the vouchers which are available to residents in every municipality now in Essex County. Um, but this TNR program allows uh, larger scale trapping and that's a really good way to actually address cat issues. And then the complaints will have gone down. There, there certainly are going to be pockets of complaints, but if you look at the number of cats that have come into us and as the only shelter in Essex County that takes cats, our intake numbers are pretty indicative of how many cats are out there. Our numbers have gone down dramatically since the peak in 2011. So these programs and these bay and neuter programs work. So I think it's really important to focus on this, this program is about fixing cats, um, feeding bands. The issue of feeding cats is going to come up whether you're fixing them or not. Because if you don't have programs like TNR programs to fix cats, people are still going to feed them and the difference is they're just going to reproduce. Even if you have feeding bands in place, there was just a, a story in the media about a 80 some year old woman who's going to jail for violating a feeding ban in the states. People are going to continue to feed so the important thing is this program is, is about getting cats fixed and that really is having the desired impact. If anyone has any questions. Uh, Councillor B. Arkman. Thank you Mr. Mayor. Thanks for coming out to see us Melling. But uh, uh, a point that needs to be made is that the town and the town's programs do not feed feral cats. We'll have people feeding feral cats, but as a part of our program or anything that we are behind, we do trap, neuter, release. We don't feed animals beyond that. And I think that's an important difference. Yes, you'll have people that have family, you know, they've got cats, but the town doesn't feed beyond the TNR. Would you agree I, with that? I completely agree that the okay. program is about fixing cats and then returning them back to the area they came from. And in a, a large number of cases, the people who had asked that the cats had be, been trapped are are the ones feeding them and are caregiving them and, and providing care to them on an ongoing basis. And they're going to do that whether you fix them or not. The difference is if, if I have 10 cats on my property and I can't afford to fix them and all I can afford to do is go to Costco every month and get a bag of food and I I put the food out very soon I'm going to have 40 cats but if the town program fixes my 10 cats then I'm going to keep spending that money and I'm going to have 10 cats and I'm not going to get more as long as I'm feeding responsibly and over time I'm going to have fewer cats as those cats get older and, and pass away so yes it this program is definitely about fixing them any other questions please councillor Bondi thank you mr. mayor um, my understanding is that if town volunteers are feeding cats, it's in order to trap them, right? Like they're luring them in the trap. And that's my understanding where our town volunteers are, my understanding of the program. I, I don't know what went on specifically in that neighborhood. I don't uh, live there, but um, can you just explain before you leave the trap, neuter, return program that the Humane Society is doing? Because if individuals don't want uh, other people to do this, they're more than welcome to trap and neuter return. Yes, and, and sorry, your point is correct that there would be town involvement in feeding the cats as, as part of trapping them, but not on an ongoing basis. So the Humane Society has a different has a few different ways we're involved with TNR. Um, one, we have done programs on our own where we've gone out and, and actually trapped cats and, and targeted areas to try to trap large number of cats in those areas. What we've found through experience with that is that that's not where our resources are best used. Our resources are best used providing resources to caregivers and people who are performing TNR. So our spay neuter clinic has a number of things we offer to people doing TNR, whether it's um, through the town program, whether it's through the spay neuter vouchers that the town offers, or whether it's through people paying on their own. Um, we offer surgeries for $50. Um, we offer multi-cat discounts. So if you have nine cats, you get the 10th one for free. Um, 
we have we for community cats so cats that are going back outside uh, we have a free microchip and a vaccine and an ear tip we include with the surgery as kind of our contribution to help keep that outdoor cat population healthy we also allow walk-ins um, on a limited basis because sometimes trapping can be uncertain so booking an appointment can be challenging so there those are the variety of ways that we assist with feral cats and TNR at our clinic um, and we often when we do a lot of those surgeries we we get a large number of, of vouchers redeemed but we also get a large number of people that are paying for those surgeries on their own as part of addressing a pop problem that they see the Humane Society is also involved with TNR um, in, a, in a different form called uh, shelter neuter return. And this is a program where if a cat is brought into the Humane Society who is not an adoption candidate or who's clearly an outside cat that's used to living outside, very often it started with just very wild feral cats, but depending on the time of year, it may be guys that are, are very clearly have been community cats. We will fix them, microchip them, vaccinate them, and return them to the location they came from. Um, um, and that's a program, it's called Return to Field or, or Shelter New to Return. Um, and this is a way, because previously for those wild cats, our option was to put them down. And so our option is saying, no, we're going to fix them and return them um, because they can do well out there and, and we wanna see them have that opportunity. So uh, through, through you, Mr. Mayor, just to clarify, so the, the resolution is to receive the presentations tonight, uh, receive the report, and uh, for council direction to administration to move forward yeah. with the recommendations? Yeah. Need a motion? Yeah. Reports for administration, 8.1 is planning report 2019-40. Read the former Harold Junior School Property Development Agreement for Anderton Developments Limited. And this is in conjunction with bylaw 1842, being a bylaw to enter into uh, that development agreement between the town and Anderton Developments Limited. Peter Mover, uh, Councillor Bjorkman and Councillor Garen. All in favor? And just to add to that, I see the school coming down today. Eight point two, planning report two thousand nineteen forty one. Natural Heritage Conservation Easement for the property located at 2135 McCormick Road. And this is in conjunction as well with bylaw 1843 to authorize the entering into of that conservation easement agreement. <coughs> mover, please. Need a mover. Uh, Councillor Bjorkman and Councillor Verbeek, any questions on this one? All in favor? It's carried. Thank you. Eight point three planning report two thousand nineteen forty two update on local planning appeal tribunal proceedings report versus the town of Essex uh, that said report be received that and as part of the or sorry and that council agrees to the adoption of the proposed additional provisions to bylaw seventeen fifty nine as part of the proposed settle, settlement to be issued under or from the local planning appeal tribunal. Have a mover, please, uh, Councillor Bowman and. Need a seconder, Councillor Garen. Any questions? All in favor? It's carried. Eight point four planning report two thousand nineteen forty three. Re Seawatts funding request for twenty twenty for receipt, and that council pre-approves the town's fifty percent share of the estimated twenty thousand dollar cost as the municipal contribution under the Municipal Partnership Fund of the Countywide Active Transportation Initiative. 
Mover, please. Uh, Councillor Bjorkman and Councillor Verbeek. Any questions on this one? All in favor? It's carried. 8.5 infrastructure services 2019-10 re stormwater infrastructure improvements for receipt and that council recommends improving the existing stormwater infrastructure pond in Townsview development in the amount of $98,442.63 uh, utilizing funds from the urban levy, the asset management life cycle reserve and council contingency. And finally, that council recommends improvements to the Roseboro storm sewer from approximately Clark Street to the Philip, Philip Ferris outlet in the amount of $84,100 and utilizing and again, a combination of funds from the urban levy, asset management, life cycle reserve, and council contingency. Mover, please. Councillor Bondi and Councillor Seconder, please. Councillor Bjorkman, any questions on this one? Councillor Bondi. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I believe to our CAO, um, there's because there's no director of infrastructure yet. So I think from how I read the development in Ward 4, this storm sewer work would be beneficial whether the development goes forward or not. It sounds like it's much needed. But are we pairing, like Townsview, that's already on its way, but are we, is this improvement conditional on the development going through or is it going through no matter what? Uh, through your worship, uh, correct, Councillor Bonnie. It's um, the Gallo subdivision is well underway. The pond expansion is is, is taking place. The uh, development off of Roseboro. This will be conditioned on that um, development taking place. When the Harrow storm sewer model is complete, we will have kind of a capital list of priorities of improvements that need to be made. And then from there, we can you know, garner our capital budget and see where we want to focus and spend our monies. But uh, without the development, we wouldn't make that improvement. Any other questions? All in favor? It's carried. 8.6. Infrastructure 2019-11 results a request for tender for surface treatment 2019 for receipt and that council awards the surface treatment for 2019 to Shepley Road Maintenance Limited in the amount of $245,185.63, including taxes. Have a mover, please. Uh, Councillor Garen and Councillor Nita Seconder, uh, Councillor Verbeek, any questions? Councillor Bondi. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you, probably to our CAO as well. Um, there's only one bid on this. I haven't liked it in the past when there's only been one bid. Is that because crews are super busy around here and it's a small job? That's my first question. Uh, through your worship, correct, there's only one bid. Uh, predominantly, uh, I guess typically in this area, there typically is only one bid on uh, surface treatment tenders. Uh, the local contractor has a, um, a good share of the market here. He does uh, from Chatham down, uh, uh, which works out well. Uh, you may, there's talks at the regional level of looking at regional tendering. So municipalities looking to group their tar and chip and surface treatment tenders together to um, make them large enough that maybe entices uh, competitive bids from somewhere else, but uh, that comes with a, its own set of complications as well. But yes, uh, only one bid. Okay, thank you. And uh, further to that, I, I don't believe our shouldering of any roads is included in that, but I was just asked to bring up that if we could look at shouldering some on the Smith and the Smith side road on the Amherstburg side, I can bring this up later. I just don't know when to bring it up, but Smith side road on the Amherstburg side has a huge hole in it. It's ridiculous. It is unsafe. I really believe this council needs to send Amherstburg a note saying the Smith is, is highly traveled by our residents. I know not exactly Amherstburg residents, but it's a liability to them. I took it today on my way here and it's they have a cone and a huge hole. And I've had complaints. People have said to me it's really dangerous. So, and Omer Lebrecht <coughs> on the other side says he would love to have it shouldered because he feels that the, our side of the Smith that we've done by driving on is, is starting to crumble. So he feels like if we shoulder it, we could save it. And I think we need to get after Amosburg again. Thank you, Councillor. The only the only problem is uh, we all know uh, I I um, directed administration uh, even to Chris. Uh, I think when Chris got a hold of Amherstburg on that issue a while back, 
and they weren't interested in doing anything on the Smith because they say it's our residents that's using it, not theirs. And it wasn't a priority. But I seen that, that hole you're talking about and somebody somebody's going to get hurt there. I agree. Uh, through your worship, just to further clarify, Councillor Bondi, the shoulder on our side of the road or the shoulder on their side of the road? So that's an operational issue, like any operational issue. I think just, uh, as I remind Council, uh, simply, you know, uh, take a service request order out so that that follows to the appropriate department, Norm and Al, and they'll look at shouldering. We have a, we've really turned around our shouldering program the last few years. Uh, we've got the proper equipment. We use our recycled stone to do it. So uh, we're making strong efforts to ensure that those roads are shouldered. So if there's a road out there that you see that has an issue like any other issue out there please let us know as far as um Amherstburg road i caution uh you know I, I know it's our residents that travel that road but i caution instructing another council what to do in their municipality i guess uh in terms of how you would feel if somebody came to this council and, and told you guys what to do uh with your roads and your infrastructure so um but uh, it, it's something we're always looking to you know in the event that we're doing capital works out there again on any of those shared roads we always look to partner uh, um, uh, with other municipalities that way so any other questions all in favor no scary 8.7 economic development officers report 2019-06 essex tourism events fund applications uh, that EDL report be received and that council approves the distribution of $4,000 of funding for the two tourism events fund applicants, uh, being the Harrell Fair and the McGregor Mug Run. Have a mover, please, for that. Uh, Councillor Guerin and Councillor Bowman. Any questions? All in favor? It's Gary. 8.8 .8 is legal and legislative services report 2019-21. And this is on with respect to bylaws 1790 and bylaws 1799. Uh, both of those bylaws received uh, two readings at the July 2nd meeting. And uh, since the July, and if I can have, once again, if I can have council's indulgence, I provided an overview of the bylaws themselves back at that July 2nd meeting. But at that meeting and, and subsequent to the meeting, we've received some feedback um, and, and comments. So what I was hoping just to run council Council through with respect to both bylaws is uh, the recommended amendments that have come as a result of that feedback from both the public and council. Um, so if I can just focus on firstly bylaw 1790, the heavy traffic, uh, the bylaw to regulate heavy traffic. Um, the the, so administration met and, and we reviewed further and so these are some of the recommended amendments. Uh, the first was just a point of clarity just to uh, make it clear in the bylaw that this only applies to municipal roads, not county or provincial roads and so certainly that clarification has been made uh, as part of the amended version of the bylaw uh, that council has uh, before tonight. Uh, there was secondly there was also concerns that this bylaw could or would unduly capture uh, heavy truck usage for certain smaller or other residential uses. So as a result of that, uh, we have in, in this bylaw uh, some proposed uh, changes to address that concern uh, so that it's not capturing uh, those smaller residential applications. So in the uh, proposed amendments, which are highlighted in yellow for council's uh, review purposes, uh, we have exemptions in part eight now that uh, for recreational vehicles or uh, the operation of a heavy traffic vehicle for the purpose of um, you know making a delivery or supplying a service to to a, a residential premise um, you know on a location that's not on an authorized truck route uh, so for those residential delivery purposes and even with that it, with that exemption there's still latitude given to the director um, that if there's multiple um, or a series of heavy traffic vehicle um, movements for those same or similar purpose uh, they can uh, the director would have the latitude or discretion uh, to address that exemption and and possibly deny it if it's because you know we we we're trying to achieve two things here we're trying to um, ensure uh, that it's not overly restrictive 
but at the same time you know we're also we're also trying to assure that um, you know that it's not um, uh, that it's not abused right so there's always that potential that it could be abused so uh, it was felt that it was important to allow for that discretion uh, with the uh, director um, and then a couple of others, uh, you know, a, a similar exemption for uh, a, a common scenario that I didn't think of when we originally drafted the bylaw, uh, a heavy traffic vehicle that may in fact be housed at a location uh, off an authorized truck route and, and may actually need that route. So uh, think of um, uh, a, a truck driver who's coming home at night. And, and so, you know, they're not, the intent obviously is not to capture uh, those kind of movements um, for that for that kind of purpose uh, the third uh, the, thirdly there was a recommendation to add Hanlon Road from Victoria to Fairview as an authorized heavy truck row uh, so we've added that um, uh, back to the schedule of the bylaw to reflect that in, in the map accordingly uh, then the fourth change that we uh, are recommending this evening the bylaw in part 8 already provided to the director discretion to provide exemptions, but we clarified this further so that uh, the director can in fact uh, either on an indefinite basis or on a case by case basis um, allow an exemption to certain heavy traffic heavy traffic vehicle movements um, from a particular business or a particular commercial operation. Uh, it was felt that this would be the more flexible way to proceed as opposed to opening it up to any and all heavy truck traffic on the and, and by making it an actual authorized truck route. So uh, you subject to the director's ability to grant an exemption to a particular commercial operation or a particular business, it would still otherwise, um, you know, it would, it would still otherwise not be an authorized heavy truck route. And so there would be a little bit of control from that perspective. Um, and then lastly, the, the one, uh, the, the other piece of feedback that came on this one was the current bylaw either did not contain an exemption for or make it clear that it, uh, the intent's not to regulate um, heavy traffic use related to agricultural purposes in the rural areas of the municipality. Um, and that was part of the discussion at the July 2nd meeting. And we, we acknowledge that at, you know, the black and white, I guess, of the bylaw as drafted on July 2nd uh, could possibly capture that. So we've expanded the exemption to allow for uh, heavy truck route traffic in the rural areas. Um, only when you know that's part of or incidental to the operation of a normal uh, agricultural practice there's no necessarily catch-all definition for what is a normal agricultural practice and so once again we have that possibility of that exemption being abused or misused and so uh, that's why again uh, the amendment has the the director of infrastructure with the um, the right to make a determination uh, as to whether that exemption in fact should be granted for that particular use uh, but but it does clarify it as far as from an agricultural point of view that we're just focusing on the urban centers um, so that's the heavy traffic bylaw um, uh, yeah if council has particular questions on this one and then I can provide a summary of the recommend changes on the other bylaw Do your worship, uh, to Mr. OJ. Uh, so, w one question that I have is, what about uh, water trucks that provide water to um, homes where they're on um, cistern rather than um, water system? So, I would I would think that that falls under the exemptions for small residential use. As um, so, we have uh, the operation of a uh, this is section F in part eight. The operation of a heavy traffic vehicle for the purpose of making a delivery or supplying a service to or at a residential premise or location that is not on an authorized heavy truck route. Um, so, I, I I think it would allow for those type of, of residential delivery scenarios. Oh, sorry, and Chris. 
Thank you. That's your worship. Yeah, the struggle we had was really trying to allow people to do their business, you know, maybe get a driveway port, get a little mulch, get a, a cistern of water, and, and still protect our roads from the guys are getting 30 loads of concrete and, yeah. and fill and, and those types of things. So we were bouncing around, maybe a permitting process would pick that up, right? And when you get in your driveway port, you need a permit to have your driveway. But if you're completely concreting your backyard, you don't need a permit. So that, that this allows us potentially, okay, you're getting one truck or two trucks of mulch. Okay, fine, that's not what we're looking for. You're getting 15 trucks of concrete. Okay, this gives me some teeth to allow for that. So it was really bounce, a bouncing game between allowing people to do their day-to-day -day business and what we consider normal household activities. And I think the intent of the old bylaw tried to do that by saying, um, it, it exempted any construction activities taking place at the home. Well, we all know where that's led us down. So we had to try and finesse that out uh, to to pick up um, the, the abuse of it and allow for the you know the water truck delivery day to day stuff. So <clears throat> just a little bit of what we went through trying to get there. And one other question, and uh, you you kind of touched on it, but I I just want to give you a scenario and tell me how this works. So we have uh, someone who loads and at the end of the day, he, he wants, to, he loads his truck at the end of the day and brings a full load home on a residential street where there's parking allowed. Um, but on a street that's a side street, that's not uh, like it's overweight. The truck is overweight, but he's coming home to his personal residence on a regular basis. Uh, leaving at 5 a.m. in the morning or 4 a.m. to head to his final destination where this load's going to be dropped off. How, how would we handle that in this problem? So right now the exemption would provide an exemption for that scenario. Um, I, I mean, there would be a requirement that, you know, that when they're accessing and, and leaving, um, that they drive on the roadways that form that most direct accessible connection between where the, that vehicle's housed at the end of the day or in, at the beginning of the day and, and a, you know, the most direct connection to the authorized heavy truck uh, route. Um, but that, that would allow for that type of a situation. <clears throat> Thank you. I just want to be aware yeah. of what's allowed and what's not. Thank you. I was asked the question. That's why I asked. Any other questions? Councillor Bondi? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. In terms of the correspondence that we received right at the beginning of the meeting, is there any merit in, in the points there? Like in bullet point one, is the word reasonableness uh, something we should include in, in point two? When the owner of the property it can't do it, can the company or person? So uh, also through you, Mr. Chair, th those are comments received, I guess, with respect to the fill permit bylaw. Um, if if council is fine, I can I can just touch upon the, uh, uh, the I'll amendments wait till, to that I'll one. I'll wait till then, but I do have one thing. My, my other thing is I think we've done a really great job with this, but we don't have a director in place um, right now. So are we pushing, are we passing this ahead of the time where the director gets to look at it? Or is our director just going to, you feel like he's going to be okay and in queue with any of this because he's going to have to be the yay or the nay guy at the end of the day and so we're slapping a big file on him the first week he gets hired going this is yay you got to do this go ahead and uh, your worship um i'm still here right so i'm here norm's here al's here richard's here all the uh, rob's here all the people that uh, uh put the work into the bylaw and understand what's going on um i actually had a discussion with with chris today uh we brought this up and we and we uh, discussed this so he's well aware of the the issue and the activities so uh, i don't see that being an issue if there's something uh that that uh um, you know, happens and then I'm, like I said, I'm still here. I can make these exemptions. I can make these, uh, you know, for these home businesses and these people that are running, uh, um, like some of the issues that were brought up through emails. These are these are how we're trying to pick those off. But, yeah. Councillor B. Arkman. I was gonna say, the, the new director inherits all of Mr. Nepsey's bylaws. So this one really isn't any different. We're just passing it now, but uh, you're gonna have to get up to speed real fast on all of them. <clears throat> any other questions? If I may, um, I, I think we should include in that bylaw for heavy trucks. I think it should be stated in there where where the driver. I know I know of a couple steel haulers that load, like you said, Deputy Mayor, and come home at night and they leave early in the morning. I think it should be stated in the bylaw they must use the shortest route. 
it, it should be in that bylaw. And through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, there is language to that effect. It talks about the most direct accessible route to the first authorized heavy truck uh, route. Uh, so through you, Mr. Chair, I... Uh, I, I need uh, a vote on it. All in Or are you so, going to want to do them both? So through you, Mr. Chair, um, I, I guess the proposed approach was, uh, it was going to provide a summary of the suggested amendments to uh, the fill permit bylaw okay, as well. Okay, and then right, after right, that, right, okay, okay, um, council could consider ahead. receiving the report yeah. and perhaps third reading to the yeah. two bylaws. So with respect to 1799, which is the fill permit uh, bylaw, and uh, so just a, a couple of recommendations um, as a result of the public feedback process uh, and the, once again, the feedback received from council uh, July 2nd onwards. Um, one of the first items of feedback uh, that was given was that it, it didn't appear that this bylaw provided an exemption for agricultural uses. And the original draft did make reference uh, to section 142, the Municipal Act, which does specify uh, a, a wide range of exemptions uh, for which the town can't uh, regulate um, as it relates to fill and alteration of grade. And so in order to make it more transparent and, and and uh, clear, uh, I, I took the provision straight out of section 142. Uh, I believe it's the uh, section five of the amended bylaw A through H uh, have the actual same exemptions that section 42 of the Municipal Act has. And so that does include uh, use for agricultural purposes um, as, as being one of the uh, legislative exemptions. So there's legislative exemptions and then we, uh, at, at the back of the same section, we have a couple more recommendations that come out of that. So that was the big change, was taking the body of the exemptions um, permissible under the Municipal Act and putting it right into the body of the, uh, the bylaw itself. Mm -hmm. um, the second piece of feedback that was received related to concerns that the, um, uh, the requirement once again, and, and kind of similar to the heavy traffic concerns, um, the requirement that taking out that fill permit would capture your smaller residential activities. Um, activities that shouldn't otherwise be, you know, caught by as wide sweeping of a, of a bylaw. Uh, so to that, uh, we did uh, amend or make a couple suggested amendments uh, to the bylaw to provide for that. Um, and just to kind of, the first one review, uh, relates to um, exemptions for uh, what they call land disturbances associated with minor gardening, landscaping incidental to residential uses. Once again, uh, as part of a continuing theme, uh, with discretion to the director um, uh, to, you know, to make a determination as far as whether this exemption sh shall apply. So under, uh, under part eight, I guess, under, sorry, under section five exemptions, A to H are the legislative exemptions um, for which, you know, the town wouldn't have that discretion. I and J are just uh, exemptions that we're proposing this evening. So the, the first one relates to minor gardening and landscaping incidental to residential uses. The second, same objective is t so as not to capture those small, uh, you know, carrying of fill uh, for small residential purposes. The second one relates to exempting the removal of topsoil or placing of fill where the aggregate, aggregate quantity of such removal or placement on any one lot does not exceed 20 cubic meters in any period of three consecutive months. So that was, that was designed once again to try to not capture those those smaller applications. Uh, and then finally, uh, as, as Councilor Bondi um, brought to Council's attention, uh, we did receive a letter uh, with additional feedback. Um, I, I just received it a few hours ago. I really haven't had time uh, tremendously to look at it, but I can comment generally. Um, I, I read it just quickly, uh, just before the meeting. And it's actually feedback that uh, it's actually feedback we had solicited uh, originally from this party probably back in May of this year, but we, we just received it this evening. But I can comment generally. 
Um, the first suggestion for feedback is, uh, as, as Councillor Bondi uh, specified, is the requirement or uh, asking that there should be a reasonable as qualifier. And so what they're stating there is um, there's very various sections of the bylaw in which it states at the discretion of the director. Uh, so certainly as part of an amended pilot, uh, as part of an amended bylaw, should it receive bylaw uh, the third reading tonight, uh, we would ensure that it, it does have that reasonable standard. Uh, and, and so it would merely state at the discretion of the uh, director acting reasonably. Um, and so, so certainly uh, we will ensure uh, that the amended bylaw has that in all aspects. Uh, the second comment is with respect to the concerns about the owner having to provide a road damage undertaken agreement. Um, the definition of the owner uh, of owner under that bylaw relates to you know the, the assessed owner, the registered owner of the property, or their authorized agent. And so once again, I, I, I think that would provide the uh, that would provide the director with discretion to either require that undertaking from the owner direct and in some situations from the contractor for hire that the owner has has, has hired. But but one of the key provisions here uh, to enforce in this bylaw uh, with respect to the owner is, is the ability, if there are costs incurred, uh, the ability to uh, seek those costs uh, either up against security that may have been provided or up against taxes. Um, so, but there is that latitude based on the owner to consider the authorized agent to provide that uh, damage undertaking or the owner or perhaps both um, and that would be at the director's discretion. Uh, the third comment states that security is cash certified check or letter of credit and and with the recommendation that a bond option um, be available so once again the wording of the bylaw has that flexibility it, it it states security is cash certified check letter of credit or such other credit as may be uh, specified um, so if there were circumstances in which the director thought that a bond was better security uh, then the director would have that ability to do so. Uh, but certainly I would make the case that, you know, security of cash, certified check, or letter of credit would be, uh, you know, definitely more recommended than, than having to go through the bond process. Uh, but, but certainly the option is there. Um, and then the last comment <coughs> states that work carried out by the town at cost plus 25% is excessive. We believe that the cost plus 10% is more reflective. So I'm not I'm not sure if this is an old bylaw that was being reviewed, uh, like an old uh, like an older version, maybe from May of this year, um, because I I don't believe the current bylaw makes a specific uh, percentage. It just states cost incurred shall be recoverable as taxes, or shall be recoverable. As an offset against security provided, um, but as far you know, the issue of cost and, and, and what the proper percentage should be as far as administration, um, I, that would that would be at the director's uh, decision, acting reasonably as we as we stated earlier. Um, but I'm not aware of the, the bylaw that council has before it um, actually speaking the 25%. Um, so so that's that's kind of my comments on that. I, it would be council's option whether. Uh, they wish to give third reading to this bylaw as amended, uh, as noted uh, this evening. Um, I guess alternatively, uh, you know, council could direct us to come back with uh, I, I, this final version of the bylaw for, at the next meeting. Um, but certainly, uh, we, we council has before the amended version and, and could certainly give third reading to that if that was their wish. <coughs> Thank you, through your worship, to Mr. Oje. So, uh, in item number two, um, owner of a property provide a road damage undertaking agreement. Mm -hmm. Is there any reason why we couldn't have um, the ability to say we want you to have a million or two million dollars worth of insurance coverage for that? And certainly, um, so as part of the fill permit, um, and even with respect to the, and I know I'm bouncing back and forth between bylaws, but even with respect to the heavy truck bylaw, uh, that is part of the requirements is to provide a certificate of insurance. I, I think I would have to check now I, I, as far as the limits of the coverage. I want to say it's a million or two to two million dollars, two million. Um, so we do have that, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, and also in, in item number, Three, um, 
I don't understand why we wouldn't put the bond option in there because I know a lot of larger companies, uh, perhaps someone like Sterling Ridge Infrastructure, would have that would be their normal process to to, mm -hmm. to go through a bond. Uh, is it that much more of a lengthy process? Or? Um, so through you, Mr. Chair. Um, generally. A bond option may, I, I would recommend a bond option might be more attractive in situations where um, larger amounts of security are needed. Um, and I don't know what that magic number is. Um, it could be as an option, uh, but but certainly, and, and having a little bit of experience, past experience in this area, um, going through, uh, you know, making a claim on the bond and going through the bond process um, can take quite a while uh, with no guarantees of success. Um, but I, I would only, you know, and that's why I, I left the bylaws being flexible, that there's certainly that option uh, to go down that road. But certainly if the opportunity um, for, you know, either the owner or the contractor for hire uh, to provide a letter of credit or cash or some other security, because it's, it's going to depend on the situation. Um, you know, the, the security provided could be very nominal in some situations or possibly waived by the director. Um, other situations, uh, you know, m might speak to uh, at least the given the the director the the ability to think about requesting a bond. But I, I, I mean, if those other forms of security can be provided, I definitely wouldn't recommend going through the bond process. Okay, so that's something <clears throat> administratively we prefer to stay away from is the bond. Uh, number four, um, the twenty five percent. I'm just wondering where the 25 percent comes from because that that does sound rather large to me uh, not that it's wrong or anything but yeah i'm just wondering where that number came from uh th what was the three mr mayor eight methodology behind it yeah, it might have just came, it might have been through an, an old draft bylaw that we had initially circulated. Um, so the 25% may in fact had been from a prior bylaw. Um, but I, I, I do I do take note, you know, of, of your comments that the 25% might might be excessive. Um, I, I don't know if, um, I don't know if our CAO in his experience has, has seen a range from 10% to 20% as far as administrative, because uh, that's what you're trying to recover largely those administrative costs uh, through worship yeah I just searched it I think it was from a previous bylaw as, as uh, mr. OJ noted before uh, this bylaw was circulated and even mark noted in his e or his letter to you guys that he did receive this in May he's just getting comments to us now so the one the you know based on our last council meeting we've gone back and re and changed it and 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 dissected and fixed all those things that, that uh, or amended all those things that, that we heard from council so the 25% is not in there but on that note I think the reason that was in there before similar to you know when we have to cut grass for people and when we have to fix roads for people these aren't uh, although they're operations of the town, that's not what we had planned to do this year. So I don't want to say it's a penalty, but it's it's um, it's there to you know cover those costs and, and ensure that that uh, we're protected and we take care of those uh, things that we normally wouldn't be doing. So uh, you know, as an average day-to-day -day road fix, sure. But on on something where we've given you a permit and you've damaged our roads, and now we have to go fix it on your behalf. Uh, you know, it, it's a bit of a fee, yeah. So, uh, but again, it's not in this bylaw, as far as I know. So we have no set value in the... No. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Um, I don't know. Oh, uh, Councillor B. Arkman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, just to clarify, so we're looking at the maps for the truck routes and things are all part of this uh, bylaw. So there was an email earlier and there was uh, brought forward with regard to Sinisac Street West. So I'm just noticing like on the map here, it's still there, but did we decide that Sinisac Street West was no longer going to be uh, part of the heavy truck route? 
Uh, so through you, Mr. Chair, um, and, and actually I, I, I spoke to it briefly at the top of the meeting. Um, this, this map is incorrect. The map should only be indicating the authorized route being Sinisac Street East uh, from Queen Street to the easterly limit. Um, going west should not be an authorized truck route, uh, but further to one of the exemptions noted under the heavy truck bylaw, there would be the director's opportunity to provide that limited exemption for a particular user. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Um, I'm going to ask council, um, do you think... Huh? Oh, Councillor Bandemont. Uh, just a quickie through you, uh, Mr. Chair. That western portion of Sinisac, how many trucks use it per month on this limited basis? Uh, through your worship. Right now, none, technically. I think what uh, what we've happened, what happens on Sinisac West or has happened in the past, you get some road truck, rogue truck drivers that are, are uh, used to uh, be accessing Celix. Uh, Celix is no longer there. Um, the route has stayed. You know, you've got the the uh, uh, the depot there um, that has a driveway on Sinisac. But again, we would prefer they enter off of Queen. If there's something that's happening on Queen and they need an exemption to be able to come off Sinisac and enter the driveway to the gas bar, okay, or to the silos or something. That's that's where we said let's pull it out. And if there's something that's special needed, that we can t they can talk to the director. You know, we've got the water plant there, so we're I mean we're exempt anyways. The other thing to note on on Sinisac, you do have an access. There is an access to the large parcel which was formerly Selix. There is a driveway there. Is the driveway large enough to house, um, you know, to be able to take a truck through there? No, not currently. Will something change in the future? Maybe, but uh, we decided that uh, that would just be a case for a special exemption. Any other questions? I got a question, Council. Are we ready to pass these bylaws, or do do we need some change, a, a few more tweaks on these? Are we ready to pass? Okay, I need a motion then to pass bylaws. Motion, Councillor Van and Dolan. So just to receive the report, yeah, receive third reading yeah. to the bylaws as amended. Yeah. Councillor Van and Dolan and Councillor Verbeek, all in favor? It's carried. Item nine on the agenda, any reports from our youth members of council? There are, uh, there are no reports this evening, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank you. Item 10, any uh, any county council updates this evening? Okay. I have about a half an hour's worth here. Uh, <laughs> no, we're, we're gonna skip that part tonight, thank you. Okay, uh, gonna receive the, uh, the correspondence, all of it. Item 11, 11.1, uh, 11 uh, correspondence to be received that the correspondence listed in 11.1 be received. Uh, and so this, this is proposed as on consent. Uh, and of course, as always with councillors uh, further having the opportunity to speak to yeah, any particular these, piece. Right. Yep. All of them, eh? Could I have, uh, could I have a mover on these, please? Need a mover. Uh, Councillor Bowman, seconder. Deputy Mayor Malash, any questions on any of these? All in favor? It's carried. 11.2 is correspondence to be considered for a receipt or uh, receiving support. 11.2.1, uh, resignation from the Municipal Heritage Committee uh, that the said resignation be received with regret and that a letter of appreciation be sent. Over please, uh, Councillor Bowman and Councillor Bjorkman. All in favor? Uh, question, sorry. Councillor Bannendon. So three, Mr. Chair, <clears throat> this is all of 11.2, all of these items? No, just, just the one. Oh, I just 11.1. Yeah, thank you. Just one. Yeah. Okay. 
11.2.2 is correspondence from the Attorney General of Ontario uh, concerning joint and several liability and insurance consultation. Uh, so this is an invitation from the Attorney General asking municipalities to participate in the government's con cons uh, consultations. Uh, and there's a questionnaire that they're asking uh, municipal administrations to fill out and provide as part of this consultation process. Uh, so uh, they're asking that the correspondence be received and that administration be directed to participate in this municipal consultation process. Need a motion to receive. Uh, Councillor Bjorkman, seconder. Councillor Bowman, any question on this one here? Okay. Uh, receive and report. Yeah. All in favor? It's carried. 11.2.3, uh, correspondence from the Township of McKellar. Uh, that said correspondence be received and that if council chooses to support be received or received and supported and that if council chooses to support this resolution the appropriate letter of support be sent mover please councillor uh ben and Owen and deputy mayor malash any questions receive and support i would like to have our uh, local uh, okay so receive and support. Okay, receive and re uh, support it, please. Motion. All in favor? Carry. And 11.2.4 is correspondence from the municipality of uh, Nebing uh, concerning the Ontario Municipal sorry Ontario Municipal Partnership Fund for receipt or receipt and support. And if council so chooses to support, that the appropriate letter be sent. Motion to receipt and support. I have a motion. No. Deputy Mayor Malash. Seconder. Councillor Bowman, any questions? Councillor Bannadon. Just uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I just want to say I oppose this because uh, taxpayers know the province has been dealing with a monstrous deficit and uh, has to be cut. We got to do our part. I don't think we can ask this. I'll be voting and opposed. Thanks. All in favor? Opposed? You want that noted? Okay, don't get our don't you? Thank you. Item 12, committee meeting minutes. That the committee meeting minutes listed in item 12 be adopted as presented with support for the recommendations noted therein. Over, please. Councillor Verbeek and Councillor Garen. Any questions on it? Councillor uh, Bjorkman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just to the uh, report here from the Essex Accessibility Advisory Committee, I've uh, got a number of good recommendations here, and some of these things we're already doing. The, the first recommendation um, is to uh, promote uh, our CIPs to the Chamber and to the BIA, which are, are things that are happening, um, and then to have a administration report back on the feasibility of adding a, a second handicap spot on King Street, which you know, which is something for us to look at. We talked about uh, accessibility earlier and how do we determine, uh, we have a, a, a formula for what happens in a parking lot, but not necessarily street parking. So somebody's looking at this and having an issue. So I think it'd be great for us to go and look at that and see if that uh, is something that we can do. Um, the third recommendation is to receive, uh, uh, to have one of our staff members uh, receive, receive the Rick Hansen Foundation Accessibility Certification Training. Uh, or at least somebody from our county should have that as we're doing our our uh, planning and stuff for our, our, our buildings, our residents, our residential areas, uh, to have somebody with that kind of uh, knowledge. So I think it'd be interesting to take that to the county and see do we have somebody already on staff in our planning that's, that's part of uh, the activities that we do that has that training in place and to make sure that we're following through with the latest uh, information we can have in, uh, in servicing our, our accessible uh, community. Um, and number four, uh, th there is a, uh, a conference in Toronto, October 31st, number 1st, and they're looking for authorization to have a committee member or a administration member go to that conference, and I think that's well worth uh, the price of the conference. We should uh, authorize them to go ahead and do that. Thank you, uh, Councillor. Any other uh, questions? Councillor Bondi? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just to our uh, rep on the Accessibility Committee. On number four, um, authorization to go to the conference, 
do they do they need, is it do they just want to have a courtesy of coming to council because really I thought they have a little bit of a budget and nobody really around here asks anybody when they want to go to a conference they just go and I would hope that that committee feels comfortable sending one or two reps whether it be a council rep the chair or a couple committee members I believe it's worthwhile and that committee doesn't spend a lot of money so in the like I don't know just in answer to that you know, yeah, they, they just felt necessary to, to bring it to council. I think they just want to show the work that they're doing, the things that they're trying to do, and, and make sure that the public's aware that there's a committee here that's doing this work. Uh, I think it was more that. Fantastic. I think that it's great work uh, coming out of our committee, and I, I look forward to uh, seeing recommendation number two vetted out. I know there's a couple business owners I've sent that little picture of already in Harrow, and they're already in support, so good work. Any other questions? Um, Doug, did you want to speak to this? Your Worship, just quickly, this committee does have a budget for conferences, so um, we'll make sure there's one, at least one member going. Thank you, Doug. Any other questions? We're gonna vote on All in favor? Carry. 13.1 that the May 2019 bank payments report be ratified as submitted. Mover, please. Uh, Deputy Mayor Malage and Councillor Vandendol. All in favor? Carry. And 13.2, that the June 2019 bank payments report be ratified as submitted. Mover, please. Uh, Councillor Bjorkman and Councillor Guerin. All in favor? Carry. Under notices of motion, we have uh, two notices of motion, one added to the adoption of the published agenda this evening. Uh, both notices of motion are for presentment only. They will be brought back for council discussion and action at the September 3rd, 2019 regular council meeting. Uh, the first notice of motion as moved by Councillor Bondi, that council have a discussion about tightening the policy of proxy voting, fixing the use of corporate resource uh, bylaw and signed bylaw. Uh, that's 15.1 and then 15.2 has just added to the adoption of, of the published agenda this evening is a notice of motion for presentment uh, and if Councillor Bondi could state her motion for us. Thank you through you chair that council give direction to the town of Essex animal control officer that any animal running at large that is apprehended by the animal control officer and in need of medical attention that the animal control officer be authorized to release the animal to the owners or deliver the animal to a veterinarian within a reasonable amount of time provided the owners are willing to cover the cost of vet fees and I'll send that to you. Item 16 on the agenda, any reports and announcements from the council members this evening? Thank you through your worship. Uh, yes, I'd like to um, let everyone know that the uh, Essex County Steam and Gas Engine Show is this weekend, their 35th annual show. It's gonna be held at uh, Coan Park on the grounds that, uh, where they have their uh, museum, Steam and Gas Engine Museum and uh, the grounds surrounding there and uh, throughout Coan Park. Um, if you can get out there, it's uh, August 9th through the 11th, um, noon till five, I believe on the Friday and then till six o'clock on both other evenings. There is a parade on Saturday morning. Uh, parade starts sharply at nine o'clock uh, from the um, parking lot in front of the uh, Essex or McGregor Community Center and Library. And uh, all councillors are, are invited to be there. Uh, we will have a truck with candy to uh, distribute, but I know it is nice and early, so uh, you should, uh, shouldn't, have, uh, shouldn't have any chance of interfering with other duties that you have that day, hopefully. So if you wanna come out, you'll get a good uh, view of a lot of uh, tractors and uh, good people. Uh, again, it's a bit of our agricultural history that goes on that weekend. And uh, we should be proud that the Essex County steam and gas engine is actually part of the town of Essex. So come on out and help us celebrate uh, again, August 9th through August the 11th this coming weekend. And uh, I will definitely be there. And uh, if you can let me know whether you're gonna participate in the parade, that would be great. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, Councilor Guerin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, yeah, congratulations and a big shout out to uh, Coach Glenn Mills and the Essex Ravens football team. Uh, they just won another provincial title. Um, varsity champs defeating Ottawa over the weekend 24 to 6. So big shout out to them. Thank you. Councillor Verbe. Um, nothing to report tonight. Councillor Bjorkman. All set. Councillor Bondi. Councillor Van Endel. Uh, yes, <clears throat> thank you. Um, I've got a donation for Parks Department. It's an annual donation, comes from the, uh, the Harrow Tennis Club. And they just wanted to pass along the message that uh, they're grateful for, uh, for how Parks uh, fixed their, uh, their tennis courts. Uh, if you remember way back in May when the uh, snow melted and the icebergs disappeared from Lake Erie, they weren't able to uh, play tennis because of the heaving. And uh, the fixing, the repairs to the, to the uh, courts were delayed by, by the weather, but they were done, they're fantastic. And the club is delighted that, uh, that money's being put aside for a new court eventually. And uh, they just wanted to remind other users that they could donate too. So, <laughs> thank you. Donation for Susan Rose, yeah. Councillor Bowman? One thing to say about the uh, Colchester Family Day, we didn't have the fireworks, but I'm working with administration to set a date uh, to have the fireworks one night. So, and the event was very successful. Um, there was a lot of people. There was more people this year than last year. It's it's getting bigger every year. Uh, I think people enjoyed the uh, music and uh, and the activities for the kids. And hats off to uh, Doug and his staff for. Uh, one, one heck of a good job down there. Thank you very much. Item 17, bylaws, 17.1, uh, bylaws for third and final reading, 1824 to provide for the Sinningham Street drain. Mover, please. Uh, Councillor Bowman and Councillor Van Dolan, all in favor of that bylaw? It's carried. 1840 uh, for third reading as well to confirm the proceedings from the July 15th regular council meeting. Mover, please. Uh, uh, Councillor Bjorkman and Councillor Garen, all in favor? Here. Uh, for three re for three readings this evening, bylaw 1838 to appoint a director of infrastructure services for the town of Essex. Mover, please. Uh, Councillor Van Adoa and Councillor Bowman, all in favor? Here. And for two readings, bylaw 1844 to confirm the proceedings of this August 6th regular council meeting. Mover, please. Uh, Councillor Bjorkman and Deputy Mayor Malash, all in favor? And one question. Looking at future meetings here, and I noticed that we have development charge background study on Tuesday, August the 27th. Is there any reason why we didn't have it on Monday, August the 26th? I, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, I, I think we were trying to pick a date in which uh, was ideal for all of administration as well. And then so we, we suggested the August 27th date uh, to council. And I, I believe we had a majority responding back. Uh, but August, having said that, August 26th was the second alternative date, if that wasn't good from the council perspective. So I'm just going to point something out that we, we've had as a general rule in the past is that Monday nights is the night that we keep open, don't book anything, you're expected to be here as part of a council for any uh, meetings that we may have. And all of a sudden this one's on a Tuesday night. There's been a couple of other meetings that have been on odd nights. And um, it's, hard to, uh, it's hard enough uh, that we have a lot of meetings, not just uh, public meetings with, uh, with us as a, count, a group as a councillors, but also with all the other committees that we're on, uh, the mayor and myself are on different committees for uh, county council as well. And uh, it's just, I can count, if I can count on having one night of the week where I'm gonna have my council meetings before the town of Essex where we meet as a council, I'll always keep Monday nights open. But if we're gonna have them random nights, it gets a lot more difficult uh, to plan a life around being on council. And uh, quite typically, I do that on Tuesday nights because that's the night where I normally do not have any meetings. Um, so it's, I'm not trying to be hard or anything. I just, 
wondered why we didn't go to the Monday night, which is something that we typically would do. Um, and I was going to ask just you, but I just wanted to, I, I wanted consensus from council members too that maybe I'm being out of line or something by by asking that. But I just I just believe that that was the consensus that we would try and have as many meetings on the Monday nights rather than have them mixed up through the week. And, and through uh, you, Mr. Mayor, certainly that's still the intent. That remains the intent is to, you know, at all possible, try to keep scheduling for those Mondays, those off Mondays. Um, you're absolutely right. We have had a couple circumstances now where we've had to look for alternative dates. Um, especially a few months ago, we were we were in a, a, a meeting cycle that was very demanding, to say the least. Um, including a lot of like planning public consultation meetings, things like that, as well as some of the additional special council meetings. So, yeah, we were challenged a little bit, um, but but certainly the the intent remains the same to try. If so, you know these um, these couple instances of a Tuesday meeting, um, you know the the intent is that they're few and far between. Absolutely. It actually worked out better for me because my youngest granddaughter turns one on August 27th. <laughs> uh, I agree. Uh, I agree with what you're saying, uh, Deputy Mayor, because 